Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Aloka David Smith. Welcome, Aloka. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rick. Nice to be here. Yeah, good to have you. Aloka is in the UK, and um, I'll read a short bio of him here and have him elaborate a bit. He was born in Oxford. That's funny. We just watched that murder mystery endeavor that was set in Oxford. I thought, wow, what a dangerous oh, place yeah. to live. Everybody's getting it murdered is, over yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. It's like the killing fields, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Morse. Morse, that was. Right, it? Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. It was fun. <laughs> uh, so he was born in Oxford in 1946 and has been a practicing Buddhist for 40 years. Um, began training with Zen, practicing with the Venerable Miyokyo Ni, a teacher from the Rinzai School, at the Buddhist Society in London. This, I'll switch to the, the way he wrote it here. This was my practice for more than five years before traveling to Sri Lanka in 1980. Here I lived for three years as a Theravada monk under the guidance of the Venerable Dhammaloka Mahatera. It was while I was in Sri Lanka that my spiritual breakthrough took place in 1981 and it is this that forms the framework of my first book, A Record of Awakening, published in 1999. Um, now, Ian, I mean, Aloka gave an interview <coughs> with Ian McNay of Conscious TV that covers a lot of this biographical stuff in detail, uh, but there's a lot of things it didn't cover, and um, one of which is I, I didn't feel that I really heard much about this awakening that took place in... Uh, this breakthrough in 1981 and um, I'm sure there's some other things you'd like to fill in um, also kind of a, a biography of Aloka's life is not going to be the main focus of this interview we're going to talk about the concept of paradox and Buddha nature and there's a whole other section of information that I'd like to discuss with with you so but let's start with filling out the bio a little bit more and and also come around to, to talking about this um, breakthrough that took place in 81 please Yes, well, um, in order for me to, um, you know, to be, 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 be a bit detailed on on the actual breakthrough, I think it's important that I do give you, I, I, do, I do put it in a framework because it didn't just pop out the blue like so many, so many uh, people that you interview, their experiences, it just, it just, you know, they have no, they have no sort of practice and these things just open up for them. Some, um, yeah, not all people, but some no, people, some no, people no, they're, yeah. they're tying their shoes one morning and all of a sudden, boom. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you really have to see this in the, in the context of Buddhist practice, if that's okay. And, and, oh, yeah, and, sure. And sort of give you the, give you the, the framework of um, yes, please. That, needs, that needs to be put in place in order for such, for such an event to take place. Okay. Um, and this, for me, came after several years of practice. Um, six, about six and a half years of, of of practice from the beginning, and 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 most of that time was, or a lot a lot of that time was really quite. You know, it's not an easy path. You know, it's it's, it's uh, you are dealing. You just learn to sit with yourself. You learn to that the practice that you take on that you're taught is very much about learning to get to know yourself. Mm -hmm. Learning to sit, learning to get to know yourself, learning to look into yourself, learning to investigate and, and follow an insightful path, which means if you're on an insightful path, you really, uh, you know, you re as I say, you really have to be with yourself and really open to yourself uh, and, and, and live the experiences that come up. There's no sort of ducking and diving, which is what, you know, which we can do quite easily in life, or at least try anyway. Th this way, it, um, it is about just being very open to yourself and, um, you know, having, having the experiences and, and, and hopefully they, they lose their edge, they burn themselves out so that you can move on to the, you know, to the next layer, as it were. Um, and, and it's important to see, to see that in this context because what's important, you know, uh, to, 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 to have this practice in, 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 a, in a Buddhist context, there is a path, the path that you follow and a very clearly defined path, it depends on the tradition that you happen to be following, but there is, there is this thing called a path where you, where you work through, as I say, these sort of layers of yourself until such time that um, it fully matures. And it's and fairly it's well uh, broken down in Buddhism, isn't it, in terms of all the various milestones that you traverse or encounter on that path? 
yes, it, 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 it depends a lot on the type of practice that you have mm. and how conceptualized it is. Yeah. Um, if you have, say, like, a, you know, for example, a Theravada um, um, practice, which on the whole I didn't, then it is very structured and it is, it is very sort of systemized and you go from one, one stage to the next and, mm -hmm. and that's all identified. If you're, if you're, if you're more on the path that, um, that I've essentially followed over the years, which you know you can say is the Zen path, the Chang path, um, the path of um, uh, <clears throat> the so-called imminent model as opposed to the developmental model. Those are the two models. Development model is one that you that you develop and you go from step to step. The, the imminent model is one is one of accepting that from the very beginning you're already awakened. So there's nothing to create, there's nothing to make. Mm -hmm. You don't actually, you don't develop anything, but you learn to just wake up to where you are and where you've always been. Okay. And, that, and that seriously conditions the type of training that you have and seriously conditions the spirit in which you, which you engage with. Um, and we'll talk about that when we talk about yeah. paradox. Yeah, in yeah, detail. yeah, 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 yeah. So... <clears throat> Um, for me, it, you couldn't really stru structure it in that way. It's really your own personal path and how things work for you and how the things that you work through. I mean, I had some very difficult times, times of quite, quite strong depression that I had at, at the beginning. The first four years were the most difficult, um, where things were, I just seemed to go through so much of my own personal stuff that was coming up, so many challenges just to simply carry on. And but for the fact that I had a teacher <clears throat> who supported me emotionally as well as gi giving advice, I, I, I don't think I would have. I don't think I would have. Um, I would have stuck at it. It was so, it was so difficult. And also having sangha, which is a very very important feature, if you're on this type of path, is to have sangha. You Meaning have to, a group of people. A you're... group of people. Yeah. yeah. You, you cannot. You cannot. A teacher and a group of people. It, you, 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 you can't do this on your own. You may think that you can, you know, but you, you, you proceed and then, and then, you, then you, hit, you, you hit the buffers. Um, and then to carry on through, through those difficult times without support. I, well, I, personally, I don't think it's possible to do. Yeah. So, well, you know, it's good, sang, to, good sang, to bring that up because a lot of people yeah. pro fall off the path, you know. A absolutely. So having you see, you need a framework around you. You need that. You need a teacher. You need a you need a sangha, and you've also got to have the correct vision and the right teaching. So it's all pointing you in the right directions. So if you've got that framework around you, then it becomes possible. Mm -hmm. Then then it's 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 it, it, it's doable. But it's still it's still it's still not easy, by by, by any stretch. Um, and it's very easy to get it wrong at any at any time. This is what the teacher's for. You know, we we can so easily convince ourselves we got it right. We know what to do. It's all straightforward. But it's also just the the, the subtleness, the subtleness of of this journey um, is such that well, you won't see the subtleness. You won't pick it, and you think you've got it right. And in fact, you've gone off on a tangent. Mm. This is why a teacher is. Well, to me, it's non-negotiable. If you don't have a teacher, I don't think you're going to pull it off. So that's the great value of the teacher. And my, my teacher in those early years supported me. Um, and that's my great gratitude towards my teacher because I would have packed up. It was very, very difficult. You know, I might uh, mention that even some of these people who have spontaneous awakenings, uh, they very often go out and find a teacher afterwards to help them make sense of what has happened. Well, that, yeah. That's that's certainly better than trying to work it out yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, and hopefully the teacher understands where you're coming from and can, you know, obviously can help you. And mm -hmm. I mean, that's that that's, that that is a great value. But but it, just just to get to that point within Buddhism, anyway, they say, well, you wouldn't even get to the to to, to the awakened state anyway. This doesn't that this traditionally this spontaneous thing that seems to be around quite a lot these days. I don't think you find any reference in Buddhism towards that at all. Everything is always done. You find a teacher yeah. and you go to whatever and you take it from day one and, and go through the, through the system, as it were. 
Well, there's two things about that. One is that I think maybe the times are changing and uh, there are more spontaneous awakenings than there might once have been. And mm -hmm. also, some of these so-called spontaneous awakenings might not be awakenings at all. They might just be some kind of intellectual realization or something mm -hmm. that, that hasn't really gone into the bones. So, you know, we'll talk about that. Yes, yes. With this, this rising of um, cosmic consciousness, isn't it? This seems to be the thing that's happened over the last few years. Well, you know, if these people who say that the, the mm. planetary consciousness is waking up are, are right, then mm. we can expect to see more of these spontaneous sure, things. Sure. Yeah. Without question, something's going on. Yeah, yeah. Because it, it's not been like this. In my 40 years, there was nothing like this until the last, I don't know, 10 years or something. Right. These things just never happened. So something's going on. Yeah. But, but, you know, well, I don't want to sort of go off on a tangent here, but for me, um, you know, my practice was certainly a lot settled after the last 18 months of being with my teacher. I actually never, I never actually went to see her at all. I was actually okay. Mm -hmm. This force for four years, a lot of stuff fell away. A lot of, you know, I, I was, I was settled and, and quite um, sort of capable of, 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 of carrying on without too much support. I mean, apart from having Sankha support, which is always with you. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and then that brings me to my, to my, why would I go to Sri Lanka? Because I was very happy with, with my teacher, with my group, with the training. I, and I was, I was quite content with my life in London. I had a good flat, good work. Um, and I went to Sri Lanka one year, actually one year I went just for, for a holiday and came back and I liked it so much that I went back again. And the second time I went, I met, I met, um, I made a point of going into to a temple, which I didn't really do the first time round. And I met, I met a monk who took me to meet his teacher. This is up in Kandy, um, who, who took me to, uh, just to say hello to him. And when I met him, he, um, he leapt off of his bed. I was massaging his leg actually, because he was. That's what you. That's what you do with masters. You just uh, you massage them when you're talking to them. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he leapt off his bed and he said he was going to ordain me. Now that comes on. I, I immediately said, "Oh no, I'm not the slightest bit interested. I've never had a calling. Never had any thoughts or ideas or desires to be a monk. I'm quite happy with what what I'm doing in London and." Um, I um I've no reason to come here. But having said that, when he said it, it fitted in with other aspects of my practice that have been with me since the beginning, maybe even before I came to the practice, that I always felt, and this is quite difficult to describe, I always felt that, that I was being supported, maybe even guided by something other than me. Mm -hmm. me as me as this person who was doing the practice there was something sort of mysterious going on that i that i i, I learned to to identify and learn to just open up to and learn to and learn to trust and it, somehow it used to i just felt it was supporting me especially in my difficult times um <clears throat> And I always felt it was part of my practice that it was with me. What I don't know. I I always got the sense in the early days that it was something external rather than in, internal. That changed, but for a long time I always felt like there was something sort of following me, if you like. And I know this well, I know guardian this, angel or something. Well, well, exactly, yeah. something along those lines. But it was something quite, you know, it's irrationally logical. You know, it can be dismissed, and many people would. You know, probably would dismiss it because it can never be proved and shown sort of rationally or you know in, in any tangible form. I know people but nevertheless, who perceive those things. You know, pardon? I say I know people who perceive those things oh, absolutely routinely. Oh, sure. It's like oh, yeah. a, you know, as ordinary real, reality for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I learned to trust it, mm -hmm. and what what I discovered with it was that that what it, whenever it sort of showed itself, whenever I felt that it was sort of supporting me or or, or or, or, or pointing the way in some way, it could never be rationalized as, ah, oh, right, yeah, that makes sense, I'm going to... But it would show me something where it took an act, an act of faith, I thought, learn to trust it, mm -hmm. without knowing, you know, all the logic, if there was any logic, which, right. which there never was any logic. But learning, learning to trust, and that's so, so important. Sure. Learning to trust. 
And if it's not well, some guardian angel, it could you can just think of it as your own intuition, you know, which is getting well, more developed. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll come to that. Yeah. I mean, this, this is in the early, early, this is my sort of perception in the early days. And, and coming to, to when my teacher-to-be said he would ordain me, and I said, oh, no, I'm not. You must be joking. I am not giving my life up and coming here to be a part of a, tra of a tradition that I literally knew absolutely nothing whatsoever about. Why should I do this? Give me a reason why. And I could think of 50 reasons why I shouldn't do it, but there was only one reason why I should do it, and that I was being told, being shown that this is the next thing for me to do, and just have the, well, the courage, I suppose, to let go, <laughs> let go of my life yeah. <laughs> and, and follow something that I was literally, had no, had no concept. I couldn't even conjure up any sort of visions and sort of, images about it at all because I knew nothing of the tradition but at the same time I knew that uh oh here we go here we go I've got to give everything up <laughs> it was part of my it was part of my I say it was a part of my practice and a part of what was beginning to sort of open for me and I had to do it so after fighting it when I came back to England I fight it fought it for several weeks and always known that I was going to give in Eventually, I did give in. So I, I literally gave up my whole life mm. in England, and I left. I went to Sri Lanka with one little bag in my hand. That, that was all, my whole, all of my worldly possessions was after having my own place and car and business, and I had one little bag like this. Mm. Just following. This is very, very important in the context of the of the whole picture here. It's, it's very, very important because this is this is to do with Buddha nature, and it's about making contact with the with the unconditioned. <clears throat> that part of you that's that's real. Of course, I didn't know these things at that time. So I went. I went on trust. I knew that whatever I was doing, I knew that it would be okay. Uh, and because that's the way things had been working for me over the previous few years, and it was a, an absolute act of trust. And I went, and I actually found it very difficult initially. Um, I had a lot of trouble with the food. I was very mal malnourished. I lived in my teacher's village temple in the middle of nowhere. I used to go begging for my food every day. I always got enough food, but there's no very very little nourishment there. Mm. I never supplied everything, and I almost oh, I almost came back. I thought well, I really felt very. I felt like I was going to become ill at any moment. I felt so vulnerable. But my teacher gave me some sort of complete food like complan thing and within a few days I was I was absolutely fine again and he sent me down to the island Hermitage, the island in the southern in, in right down the south of the island where I spent most of my time and where where things my whole training began to develop mm -hmm. so once I settled there um, took on a particular type of meditation which was traditional for, for Theravada and it was over those next few months where <clears throat> everything inside me just started to open up. It's like I took a like I took a knife. I sat down, become quiet, looked in, looked in at myself, just looked looked at the whole of me, uh, and just started to to investigate and, and to cut open which the the tools of this particular training give you fantastic fantastic. Um, traditional form of insight practice uh, and I use these tools and I, and I was which I never did before when I was in England I had a different training altogether different practice altogether and this completely just cut me open and just blew open and just the sort of wonder and, 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 and just the, the fantastic experience of, of what was being revealed as to like my reality, my, my, my sangsara, my, my relative life, my relative world, because that's what it does. I'm beginning to get little tasters of what's beyond it. What, well, what was the experience actually? Because you say cut me open, but what do you, what, what well, were you, how would you actually describe the well, experience? Well for, exa well, for example, I'll give you an example. You know, the, the, the actual practice is called the action of the three signs of being, that everything is, imp I don't know if you know this, everything is impermanent, everything is suffering, and, and everything is not self. Mm -hmm. There are three tools. There, there are three truths of the phenomenal world. Everything obeys that, that, that law, those laws. So when you settle down, concentration, 
find stillness, which is paramount to be still. You have to find stillness. It's number one to find stillness. You then take one of those tools. You look at yourself, whatever may be. I never had a formal path, as it were, a formal system that I followed. I just had a very free and open one. Whatever, whatever showed itself, I would look at parts of my personality, things that I was holding on to, whatever was going on at the time, nothing sort of, you know, massively important, but just things that you were, that I would be, maybe some things were important. And, and, and the way it would work is that you would look at this particular attachment that you had, you had ID, you could, you had, um, you could see it, it, it or, 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 almost, almost physically, you could see the pictures, you could see the attachment that you had for something that was very precious to you. And so you, you would look at it and you say, well, okay, if that's, that's the way it is, where am I? Where is this person that's attached? This thing that seems to be very solid, like a solid entity, like your thoughts are some, something like a solid, a solid form, um, to look at that, to look at, look closely, look closely at, at a, a particular phenomenon and see that in fact it wasn't something solid, that when you look at it, it's something that actually is made up of lots of other conditions that happened to come together at that time that created this, this notion of the, the, a reality of, of whatever you were thinking about. And so that solid thing that you were that you were convinced was a real solid entity, uh, you, you begin to doubt it. And of course, the, the, the thing, the thing more than anything that you look at is, is the me, is the me, is the self that's doing all the attaching and, and looking for the self and looking for this person and never finding. And all you find is a lot of conditions that just happen to come together for, for they, they, co-production they all they all help each other so that you end up creating this thing that you then hold on to and it becomes me and mine and and you know my, my possession and, and then all the angst that goes around when you attach and all the all the you know all the anxiety of life and holding on to something you know which is what we all experience but actually finding what you're holding on to it's just uh, it's just a collection of bits and pieces and there isn't actually anybody there anyway doing the whole thing so the whole thing just begins to fall apart mm. it's a bit like you know just a, a simple parallel it's like looking at a car you see a car oh isn't that beautiful it's my car it's fantastic i'm in love with my car it's the most important thing in my life okay but then but then you 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 get close to your car, or maybe a car that you want to buy, and you know all the, all you the, Im, the you've just got one image of a car. That's what I'm saying. But when you get close to it, you find well, hang on a minute, this car it isn't it's made it's actually made of bits that are all bolted together, screwed together, welded together. All all so actually, there's no such thing as a car, but a collection of bits. You don't fall in love with bits. You fall in love with the image that they create when they're all put together. But the reality is that, in fact, it's just a collection of, I say, nuts and bolts, basically. And all these, you know, but then that, 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 that same sort of image, that same metaphor goes for yourself. That when you look in there and you're looking for this person who's so precious, is the most important person in the whole world that you'll do anything to defend and shore up, protect promote, reinforce. Um, actually, when you look when you look closely at it, you see that it's just a bundle of conditions. Mm -hmm. So the thing begins to break up. And that has consequences. I mean, because your whole makeup is made up of, 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 of the absolute conviction that you are, I am this person, and I own this, and I am this and I am that, with, with, with views of this and that, and also physical possessions and and, and, and mainly the possessions, the possessions of your own body, uh, uh, you know, so that you, you, you get a sense of a, of a, of a solid entity. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and the great thing with these tools is they, they begin to begin to cut the whole thing, the whole thing begins to break up. And these tools and, were um, like a sitting practice, right? Where you, you're sitting, yeah, it, it's the concept. meditating for hours on end or something. Yes, you, you would sit, you would sit and you would evoke one of the tools. Mm -hmm. For me, anatta, as it's called, not self, right. is the one that always attracted me most. Mm -hmm. So anatta, so 
like I say, I'd be so attached to, to, to something that's so precious to me. But then I'd go looking for this person who, who, who is attached. Where is this person? Just, just let me see you. And of course, you know, the, the closer you look, the further away you get from actually finding the thing that, that you are so utterly convinced is, is real. And, and you, were so able, you were able to sit and focus and do that in a consistent way without your mind wandering off of, oh, well, I, you know, the weather here is kind of hot and I should probably be well, back in England. I yeah, mean, it, yeah. all, you know, what the mind does. <laughs> <laughs> sure, that's what the mind does. Well, well the, 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 in time you become, you know, you, you become capable of when those little things do flit in and they do, you don't follow them. Right. You just leave them and they go away. So you never follow them. You don't. You don't get caught by them. So you just let it go and you come back and you stay with that that thing that's very um, very grounded within you. That's that's that that's, that, that, yeah. that doesn't that doesn't move around. So you can you can look in and it all comes with stillness, mm -hmm. which is what needs to be learned. Let me ask you a question here. I've I've been interviewing some Buddhists lately or people who do Buddhist practice. Um, last week was a, a well-known TV uh, newsman in the U.S. named Dan Harris, and he happened to mention that his he had he had meditated just before our interview, and I said, "Well, how was it?" And he said, "Oh, it was rough. You know, it was really unpleasant, but I just soldiered through it." And uh, and you know, in my own practice, it was kind of a, a different nature. Uh, I've been doing it for 46 years, and and it's always been pleasant. You know, which. I sort of, um, in, in blissful, enjoyable, re restful, rejuvenating. And so, I mean, the old, more fundamentalist me would think, well, there's something wrong with a practice that uh, is difficult and unpleasant. Uh, you know, it's not as good as my practice, which is easy and enjoyable. But, uh, but the, the newer me, uh, having interviewed so many people now, many of whom have had profound awakenings as a result of a practice that in inherently wasn't that enjoyable, um, it's taking a second look at that whole notion, and uh, you know, there, there's apparently really different ways of going about it, and you know, m different paths can all lead to the same goal, perhaps, or, or maybe they lead to different goals. Um, anyway, comment on that if you would. Yeah, sure. Um, well, it sounds like you've got yourself what would technically be called like a I don't know what practice is, samatha, um, a, a calming practice. Um, well, I learned went... Transcendental Meditation in 1968, oh, right. you know, okay. and uh, I do something a little different now, but along the same lines, but it's, yeah. all, it's always been kind of smooth and easy. Yeah. But well, fruitful, that, you know. That's, well, okay, that, that's fine, yeah. you know, if, if it's something that, that you enjoy, mm -hmm. but if you want to get, if, if, it, if it's something that, that is important to you or even burns within you, that you want to get to the bottom of the human condition. Why, why, why is life like this? Why am I like this? Mm -hmm. Why is there this sense of unsatisfactoriness? You want to get to the bottom of that. You've got to learn to, to burrow into who you are. You can't sort of stand outside and, and, and have those sorts of experiences. You, as I was just trying to explain to you, mm -hmm. you've got to get in there and you've got to, you've got to see the reality of this person that, that you're convinced who you are, that you've been convinced all, all your life who you are, because that's where the trouble is, is this sense of me, me, you see that me is, a, is, a, is at the bottom of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So you want to get to know, you, you, need, you need to get in there and sort of winkle it out as it were, or get <laughs> to see it and break it up, because this is, this is the cause of suffering. Well, okay, <laughs> that, that requires you to go on a journey, which is, which is what, um, you know, in Buddhism, it's, it's called a path that you that you uh, that that you go on that journey into yourself, and you break. And now, on that journey, some bits are great, as as you say, you hit you hit the lovely bits and, and the bliss, and the rapture, and all the sort of heavenly heavenly uh, experiences that you can have. But the truth of yourself is, it is that you're you're a, you're a mixture of, of lots and lots of stuff, and, and a lot of that stuff is extremely is not nice at all. Oh yeah, well that, that we comes have up a, too. We, we have a yeah, we have a dark side. Yeah, yeah. And and what we all have a dark side, even though some of us, most of us, don't go near it because it's terrifying. Mm -hmm. It frightens the hell out of us, so we don't go there, and we spend our life avoiding it, in, in just being busy and doing things, chasing things. We don't, we don't, we don't want to know that. Right. But if, but if you want to know the truth of things, you've actually got to turn around and 
face it and, and walk into it. Uh, and that journey is, well, you know, a walk on the dark side is not, is not just by definition, it's not, it's not an easy thing to do. This is why you need support. You need a teacher to guide you and you need that, that, that support around you so that you can begin to make that journey. And when you make that journey, you begin to wake up to see what you're doing, mm -hmm. that you created this world, you created this angst, this unsatisfactoriness is actually something that you've created, that actually is not created by your parents and by your teacher and by your boss and all of that. You actually, actually, you are spending your, your life minute by minute reinforcing it. You're feeding it. You're feeding it, but you're also being caught by it. So what you need to do is to understand that. You don't know that because you're so far away from it in your, in your, in your sort of conscious world. As I say, most of us push that out of the way. We don't want, we don't want to go there. We don't want to see that. You begin, you begin to wake up. This is called waking up. I'd much prefer, I, I really don't like the word enlightenment. I like the word awakening because awakening is, it, it describes it perfectly. Enlightenment to me is, it's got too many connotations. Awakening, you begin to wake up and, and, and awakening isn't this, you know, this breakthrough. We say you, we break through and you're awakened. Actually, awakening starts the moment you take this training on. The moment that you're prepared to turn around and look at yourself and begin to, to, to investigate and to look in. And, and when these forces, these, these, these forces begin to, to well up, rather than run away from them or react to them as we do, as we spent our whole life doing, we learn to just stay with them and open to them. Leave them alone, let them come, learn to bear with, learn to, but don't feed them. That's the key. It's not to feed something. Right. So that in time, if you don't feed it, it begins to fade. Mm -hmm. And whilst you're staying with and you're opening and you're looking, you're beginning to see what's going on here. What is going on here? Not what you think is going on, but what really is going on. And when you, when you begin to see what's going on, that's called wisdom. And that wisdom will then be like a tool that will help you essentially, I think essentially, learn to say when a habit comes and, you, and you're about to follow one of your habits that may be good or bad, that may be something that you enjoy or not enjoy, but we're just a bundle of conditioned habits, you can learn. Now you're beginning to get a vision, beginning to get an understanding of what's going on here you can say no no i'm not doing that i'm not going to i'm not i'm not going to follow that that's 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 the path that, that you embark upon now that path can be incredibly at times very very joyful suddenly the whole thing can burst open and you can get you can get and you, and you you can you can convince yourself you're awakened because you 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 you're, you're momentarily momentarily you're transcending the condition into what is the real, which is what is with you all the time. It's sitting there. It never goes away. It's permanent. It sits there and you get little glimpses. And a lot of people say, oh, I'm enlightened, I'm enlightened. But all you've got is a glimpse. Then the door shuts again and you're back in with, with all of your stuff. Now you can choose to go down that path. That's, that actually is for the few. The people that want to get to the bottom of this. I've had enough of this. I've had enough of being enslaved to this, this mind of mine. And, 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 the attack, and the fear the fear that controls my life and everything in my life seems to be based in fear. Everything I do, I'm just either running away or looking after myself, doing something to, to protect myself all the time. And that is, you see, the cause of suffering. So on that journey, it, you can, as I say, by all means, you can have these lovely times when everything is all peaceful and lovely and why not because it's a part of your natural makeup you're accessing who you really are because yeah. you really are at peace you're not in turmoil your true nature is not in turmoil so so if you put the conditions in place you know like in meditation you can begin to get a little taste of who you really are but but that's impermanent it will come and go if you really want to make it something permanent something something that's with you when you're not meditating something in your daily life just coming and going the challenges that, that we have on a daily basis if so that you don't get pulled around by your habits so things as it were just pass through you you don't follow all the all, all of those those ways that you've reacted in the past you've got to get to know yourself so that whatever it is that's reacting 
you, you learn to see, look, here we go again. Here I'm off again. I'm feeding those habits that, you know, could be very unpleasant. I'm about to say something to somebody, which is really, but this is what I do. This is how I look after myself. You begin to see that, that this is what you're creating for yourself. Never mind the effect it has on other people. Um, and so you, you learn to, you, you learn, you learn to say no, but you're saying no, not just through blindness, but you're learning to wake up. So you're actually saying no through wisdom. You actually know that the way, the way to go beyond these habits is not to feed them. And I'm not feeding them anymore. Mm -hmm. And if you can learn to work with that, and this is, a, this is a lifetime. Don't give me this sort of five minute stuff. This is a lifetime because the stuff what we've got inside of ourselves is accumulated for so long, it doesn't exhaust itself just because you want it to. It takes a lot of commitment, a lot of coming back and coming back. But in time, in time, things begin to, to lose their power over you, it begins to become less of a, a bondage. <clears throat> and you so, begin to get a sense of spaciousness yeah. with your life. And on, and on you go, and on you go. We're not even talking about enlightenment, like like the sort of breakthrough that that, that people talk about. These mm -hmm. these things can happen. But this is the path. This is the nature of the path. And also, you don't. So, something I've noticed. You know, I've, I've heard, I've listened to a, a lot of talks or a number of talks, and just trying to sort of understand them in relationship to how I understand my own personal experience, but how it fits the tradition is that, you know, believe it or not, you don't have to have any ambition to be enlightened. You don't have to make that an issue in your life. It, it, it doesn't even have to cross your mind. It doesn't have to be a motivation. You just want to be a better person. That's actually what motivated me. I just, I didn't see, I didn't like the ugliness that I saw inside of me. And that was my motivation. I wanted to become something like a proper, a true human being, something that's, that could be of use to you know, to, to those around me, um, I, I, I honestly never ever, it never crossed my mind that I wanted to be awakened. I wanted that great breakthrough that you read about and you hear about. It only, it only actually came to me two days before it happened, actually, mm. and it just came out of the blue. I never even thought about it. But, so what I'm saying is that that awakening experience actually is nothing to do with you. It has none of your business. Your business is to find the equanimity in your makeup, in, in, the, in, in that relative, in samsara, as we call it. Samsara, the, the conditioned, the dualistic conditioning that we create, we feed, we nurture on a daily basis. Is that we learn, we learn to, to, to wake up and see this. This is, this, this is the cause of bondage and of suffering and of the angst of life and the cause of rebirth. That, 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 you, that, you, that you focus on exclusively, that's called the path. Its result, because it will, because it's a natural, it's a natural process, it doesn't require you to do anything to make it happen deliberately. If you, if, you, if you did that, I don't see how it, because that to me is just attachment and desire to want that to happen. That, that awakening is, is the natural fruit of, 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 of maturity, of, of, of finding that equanimity, which we can talk about. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like, you know, it's like a, <laughs> a fruit tree, an apple tree that, 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 um, that, 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 that nurtures a, an apple over weeks and months and it nurtures it, it feeds it all the time. It feeds it, it grows and it gets bigger until it reaches full maturity. And then it, and then it stops giving it any more nourishment. And then it sits there and one day the apple falls off the tree. The tree doesn't shake the apple off. The tree will, the apple, will, the apple will fall off when, when the time is ripe, when it's ripe, when it's fully mature and everything has been done, it will just naturally fall off. And that's, that, I think that's the perfect metaphor for this, that, that, that whole, and this is one of the things that sort of, it's got to me a little bit that people seem to think that it's something that you can manufacture deliberately that you can get to this enlightened, this, this enlightened experience. And that, that I know, does it, that, that doesn't pertain to, to, to the Buddhist path. You can, you can talk about, people do talk about awakening and, and, you know, its consequences and the experiences that come out of that, fair enough. 
but that's not really the path that's you know that's like a an aspiration something to 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 to, to encourage you and something to give you interest but it isn't the actual path itself it isn't the actual training um, because, as I say, the, the fruit, the fruit, because this is a wholly natural process. This is not man-made. We're part of nature. You know, and Dharma, Dharma as, is a major word in Buddhism. Dharma meaning the truth. And another, another, another um, definition of Dharma is, is nature. It's nature, it's natural. It's got nothing to do with it. We think, you know, we think that we're in control. Um, <clears throat> You know of the world and the universe, but we are just part of a part of a, a natural, a natural, mysterious unfolding. And and when and we estrange ourselves from that, but when we find that place of equanimity, which I can come to, um, the fruit the fruit will fall on its own, and it won't fall until it's ripe. And you will never make it fall by an act of will. And that, that that's 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 very and that's that's you know that's very much as part of the philosophy of Buddhism, which does seem to bump in a bit to okay. uh, to, to some of the things that are going on now. Right. So there's a lot I could have said and, and questions I could have interjected and all that. Um, but mm. let's just take your last point. You can never make it fall by an act of will, um, and yet it seems that um, Buddhist <clears throat> meditation practice, from <clears throat> what I understand of it is quite willful. There is an application of individual <clears throat> effort. I am going to sit here, my knees are killing me, but I'm going to continue to sit here by golly, and you know, I'm not going to let yeah. this or that distract right. me. So there seems to be a rather fierce application of will during the practice, at least initially. But I guess, so, so comment on that for a minute, but let's, sure. let's well, stand up. Well, I used to, because somebody says, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to sit here willfully, it doesn't say going to be awakened. No, that, that, but, that's the, what, but they're no, applying will to... You know, there, there, is, there, is, there is one feature of the training that's very, very difficult to pick, to see, to know. What is the difference between commitment, commitment to the training and willfulness? Mm -hmm. And to find the difference, because it's very easy to be willful, willful is very easy to identify. I'm going to, as you say, I'm going to sit, I'm going to sit here for the next 10 hours, nobody's going to move me. <laughs> I'm going to do this day after day. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know what that's because people do that doesn't mean to say that it's right. Mm -hmm. it's, it's people do it. People get, people get things wrong, you know. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there has to be this thing called commitment, whereby, whereby this training is not, is not. You, you cannot do this training that's going to bear any fruit by having it as a sort of a part-time thing that you're doing, like it's a hobby. You just flick in and flick out, and when it's inconvenient you go and want to go and do something else and then oh i come back to this training or i come back to my meditation because it's because it's convenient for me yeah so let's but say you're a really committed practitioner you're dedicated right. and right. and then and you have a daily practice that you're really committed to so when you sit down to do that daily practice are you um applying a lot of individual will or what and to no, make the practice that, work this thing this thing this 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 commitment is something you have to feel and and find within you. Willfulness can be very, very obvious. I'm going to do this. I'm going to achieve that. You can't do this without. You can sit there and you have, a. I think conviction is, is probably one of the best words where, where you know that you need conviction. If you want, if you want to get to the bottom of this, if it's, if it's what, if it's what you want to, you want to understand why you are the way that you are. You've got to have a commitment, but an inner commitment, something quite, it's like a quiet commitment whereby, and it's not just sitting on the cushion, it's your daily life. Don't mm -hmm. think this is all about sitting on your backside. That's only, a, it's, a, it's the single most important issue, part of it. But we have four postures and this training, what you're doing essentially on the, on the, on the cushion, which is learning to focus and be still and to open, you have to learn to take that into your daily life. So that it becomes something that you experience throughout the day. Now that's only possible through commitment, and it, it's a quiet inner inner determination that's not the same as willfulness, which which you which you can experience. It's something it's something that nobody else in the world need know that you are a committed practitioner. Right. You don't go around with a, you don't go around with a thing flashing on top of your head. Look at me. 
I'm a serious Dharma practitioner. I sit 10 hours a day. People talk to you in those terms. That, that there's something missing there. That that does smack of willfulness. It's like, you know, you, you talk to people who actually are committed that, that do sit, and it's not about sitting hours and hours every day. You do that on retreat in your daily life. An hour, an hour a day is more than enough. You've got a life to live. You go on retreat. That's where you put a lot of you put a lot of hours. But you go about it in, in a quiet way. Nobody needs to know about it. But it's just an inner determination that that you know is in a different place than this 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 willfulness. Okay, so if um, you're sitting for an hour a day or longer on retreat and and you're sitting there, um, willful. I mean, is it the actual practice you're doing? Sometimes the images of strain and struggle and and kind of an inner mm. battle come to mind, mm. and so and you know and that to me would make it a very unpleasant experience. Uh, all this kind of you know struggling with yourself and and but but maybe there's a subtler approach. And I'm wondering if this is how is what you, what you would consider correct practice, where there's just a sort of a, a an intention, and uh, you know if the mind wanders off, you just bring it back, but without beating yourself right. up over it. it. it that's right. It's an intent. Absolutely, you don't beat yourself. That there is, there is this. It's like you know, you know. For me, it's like I sign a, every time I sit on the cushion. I, I make out a contract with myself. Mm -hmm. I say for the next forty minutes, which is as long as I sit, I'm going to sit as still and as quiet as I can, and 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 just give myself, let go of all the distractions, whether it be physical mental or emotional let them go and come come to that place of stillness that we've all got that i know exists that, that i'm familiar with and when these things come in that i've already committed myself to let them go now when they come along it's not a case of get out of the way <laughs> you know don't disturb me i'm bad enough for you you you, you can't go down that road yeah. that is willfulness that is just suppression if you're doing that you have to see them and know them but know that you are committed for the next 40 minutes to come to that place of awareness, to come into awareness, awareness without boundaries, that stillness that, that, that is our natural condition, that you don't manufacture, yeah. that, that you find that place and you, and you, let, and you let these things go um, as much as you can. You don't get involved with them and you don't have opinions, you don't try to, you know, do anything with but rather simply let them go and do your best and if it doesn't work and it won't a lot of the time they'll 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 win they'll come and they'll take in you'll be off in your fantasy for the next quarter of an hour that's the way it is okay yeah so you say ah oh, you don't you don't start beating yourself up okay this is this is so important you have to let it go and determine just to come back into that stillness that's, that's why I asked that, about it a bit, because when somebody tells me that they sit and meditate and it's, it's mm. kind of a really unpleasant experience for half an hour or whatever, mm. I wonder, are they struggling? You know, are they straining? Are they kind of actually introducing a, a much more individual effort than is, than mm. is really called for mm. in, this, in the situation? Let, 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 me give, let me give you an example with that. You know, you know one of the, one of the, it's something I always in, encourage my, my, my students to do. Because they, they can come to the group and they have all sorts of different postures and things. Um, and I encourage them to, to try and try and sit in the half lotus. And there's not many can just some some people can just some people sit in the full lotus, but the half lotus for most of us Western people is, is challenging because we just don't have suppleness of body. But it's doable. But it very very rarely is it just given to you on a plate. You have to sit sometimes for weeks and months, and it's very difficult. You get you know you can't. You can't avoid the fact that it's, this is damn painful. But what you do, but what you can do there is that you develop a relationship with that experience. You develop a relationship with that thing called pain, my pain, my body. And you learn to sit with it. And you learn to see, you learn to open to it. You don't run away from that pain. You don't suppress it and push it away in any way. But in time, if you learn to learn to stay with it and stay with it and stay with it, and see that this is not my pain. This pain doesn't belong to me. This actually doesn't doesn't belong to this body, and this body doesn't belong to me. And what you can do, you, you're not avoiding the experience, but what you're doing is that you're learning to take the me thing, me, oh me and my, me, 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 me and my pain, me and my suffering. 
that when you that when you when you go down that road, me and my pain, me and my suffering, you are compounded. I like the, the way I like to describe it is that you make mountains out of molehills. Molehills, that's life. There's always going to be molehills. That's the nature of this realm that we live in. But we make mountains out of molehills. And you learn, and you learn just through learning to sit with that, that can be incredibly, and I know personally speaking, you know, I sat half lotus for nearly all my meditation years, but it wasn't given to me on a plate. I really had to sit, to sit through that. But I tell you, I learned so much about attachment. I learned so much about me. And I learned how to just bear with, to stay with, and to not identify with that experience and leave it as a molehill rather than, rather than make it into a mountain. That is, that is, that there is so much understanding there for you, for you to access, but you have to sit through it. Okay. Good. And, and you sit through it in the right way. You don't sit through, oh, me, well, why me, my legs? I'm going to be a cripple. I'm never going to be able to meditate again. Me, 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 me. That's what you've got to see through. There you're making a mountain. And by golly, you will suffer. You will suffer far more than you, than you need to. This is that inner, that inner, that inner thing. That just, okay, I'll sit with it. I won't, I won't, I won't fight it. I won't run away from it. I'll just learn to sit with it. These are the, subtle, the subtleties of the path that you have to learn to, to, to cultivate the inner strength. And what that does, uh, as well as the insightful thing, is that when you learn to sit through things, you get inner strength. Mm -hmm. Something that a lot of us don't have. We run away from things in life. We got money in our pocket. We don't have to bear with anything that we, that we don't like. Most of us, we don't like in our life. We can buy ourselves out of un, un, difficult situations. Okay, you can do that's what that's probably one of the main reasons why money is so important to us because it can help us look after ourselves. But you won't learn anything about yourself, you avoid yourself. This way, you learn to sit and you learn to see what you are creating for yourself. Look, just look, but that that's these, these are the subtleties of this training that you can only do through trial and error because you will react in the way you've always reacted but you have to learn to let those let those habits go and go beyond those habits uh, and that then gives you the experience it gives you the inner strength so when the next thing comes along because there will be something around the corner you learn to just bear with bear with you know there's a there's a very important um concept in in buddhism called kishanti in patience but patient endurance mm -hmm. patient endurance that is so critical so crucial on on this whole of of, of letting go of this thing that that, that we are trapped by this, this 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 thing that we called samsara that we create for ourselves this is all part of the subtlety of the of the path that, that, that we learn and if it's willful if you if you and you can't help but being willful in the beginning because you don't know anything else but you have to learn to oh, hang on a minute you, you discover that other part of you that has the inner strength to sit and bear with things without getting up there you know waving an axe or a hammer or something i'm going to beat you you you've got that attitude all you do is all you do is reinforce the self that's all you do and you're just creating a more entrenched mm. ego ego yeah you know which is not what we're meant to be up to yeah good point so let me um, circle back to something you said a few minutes ago. You said that the desire for awakening or something didn't really become strong until a couple of days before it actually happened. So what actually happened? Uh, tell tell it, us it, about it, your awakening. Okay, well, I've just sort of given you... Oh, it's important to put all these other things in place first because okay. I don't want you to get the impression that it's just it just fell out of the sky, is it? Right. Really? No, you really you know, applied this yourself. Is year, this is years of... of, of, of I believe to be dedicated commitment sure so so that things things fall away and, and make this event possible mm -hmm. um that 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 uh, what, what i did as, as a monk i used to sit i used to sit a lot every day as a monk that's what you do i mean it's one so that's what you get paid for you don't get paid but that's your job if you're if you're that sort of practitioner you will sit a lot and i did sit a lot a day but then but then there was a three month retreat that i decided to do and just be on my own um 
a solitary retreat on my own. And so I, I upped everything for that. And it was only three or four days, three days before, before the event, as I call it, um, when I knelt before my Buddha, which is what I do every day and bow my head and, and, off, and offer this Sangsara, offer this David thing or Aloka, well, Aloka then, David was my other name, um, continually handing it into, into, that, into that part that I was alluding to before that was with me opening, opening up, showing me the way, developing a relationship knowing that that was supporting me opening up seeing something that was mysterious something that was that was inconceivable something that i would never ever be able to possess ever be able to own only to have respect for only to have well to, to live in awe and, and 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 to and to see the greatness of something that i was beginning to touch so every time i i i, I would kneel and, and, and bow my head as all religious people do spiritual people do whatever they're whatever they you know whatever reason why they're doing it for me it was to surrender this me thing to that part of me that, that was supporting me and whilst doing that and also asking for help support because it's, it's so difficult with these forces coming to you all the time so difficult please help me you know help support me while i sit through this <laughs> Uh, and by golly, it was there. It was it, it was absolutely. There. And it's only when I was doing that, you know, saying I'm going to be sitting all these weeks. Please help me. And it just it just came up, and I just said, I'm not I'm not I'm not going to I'm not going to leave this this cushion. I'm not going to leave this this retreat until I'm awakened. Mm. Uh, and and as soon as I said that, I went, What? Where did that come from? Because it was it was absolutely spontaneous. There was no thought whatsoever. I didn't plan it wasn't part of the part of the stuff it just <clears throat> spontaneously came out which was which was very interesting that that happened that's the, and I promise you that's the first time in all, all, in all my years of, of, of practice did my mind ever go in that direction of awakening <coughs> ever <laughs> you think that's radical I remember hearing a story about a guy who lit an incense stick and he said if I'm not enlightened by the time this incense stick burns down I'm going to kill myself <laughs> and somehow I guess he managed to get enlightened before because it you are setting you are setting yourself up here I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't recommend I wouldn't recommend this to people no I wouldn't either because you're, you're creating a tension there within yourself that mm. oh my god I got to do it and as soon as you go down that road you're in trouble because yeah. you can't. It, it's not, as I say, it's not something that you can make, manufacture. It popped up. It came out. It surprised me. But at the same time, but at the same time, I put it to one side. It wasn't something that suddenly, you know, was right. sitting in front of me. I just put it to one side. But what I, you know, to make this interesting, to make this, you know, rather me just get to the bit that you want me to get to this whole this whole path that focuses exclusively on the on the on the conditioned on the you know you have you have um what is it called the uh the the um the part of you that's my, I've, I've forgotten the word for a moment it's what is it's what we live in it's what we're caught by i mean buddhists would call it samsara relative in the absolute mm -hmm. um this this is this is the relative the relative means that it's that it's dualistic that it's, that it's a creation um that the whole of buddhism as i say the whole of buddhist practices focuses on this phenomenon and that phenomenon the, the way it works the nature of that works is that it's dualistic and it's about feeding it and it's like something that oscillates all the time like this you feed i like i don't like this is good that's bad i want i don't want etc and all the time you're feeding one side or the other and you and you bounce if you look at yourself everything in duality requires the other side nothing exists on its own it has to have a it has to have an opposite so that so that this thing and that so the whole phenomenon is this thing that's that's just going like this that, that's that's maintaining its existence by by being fed with 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 stuff that that feeds one side or the other so 
the whole thing keeps going. Now, when you come to Dharma, Dharma training, that's about stop feed. You're learning to stop. I'm being technical now. You're learning to stop feeding it by learning, as I've as I touched on earlier, of not of not following your habits by learning to say no to things. And what you're doing is that you're no longer feeding something that, that keeps this thing going like this. So in time, this thing that goes like this begins to lose its massive power, massive grip that it has upon you and begins to begins to come back into some sort of equilibrium. Hmm? Because you no longer, because if you don't feed it, this is what will happen. It will come like, it needs to be fed. Oh, I like, I don't like, I'm right, you're wrong. You know, what, whatever, whatever, how you engage with it mentally, emotionally, is, is, is this thing that we call samsara, you know, that, that, that the relative. Um, so what, so the whole, the whole path of Dharma training, that's it's not seen in these terms, I don't know if I've ever heard it expressed in these terms, is it, it, it's about bringing those two things so they come into equilibrium like this. So you reach the point where you no longer feed, literally you're no longer feeding. This is called equanimity. Equanimity, technically it's called equanimity towards formations, whereby you enter a period, and this is not done by an act of will, this is the natural process of letting go, so the thing becomes more and more a sense of equilibrium. And then you reach the, the, real, the real refining part where you literally do not hold on to anything. Whatever thoughts come into your mind, and, and you, think in the, you, think, you think as you think, but you don't hold on to anything. Everything, you just have complete and utter disinterest in everything. I mean, I mean literally everything. And, and for me, this went on for, I think it's two weeks, three weeks, where, and of course, one of the things that you're not interested in is you're not interested in meditation anymore. <laughs> but still, you drag yourself to the cushion and you sit and you do your best to be still and open and all the rest of it. But at the same time, there's this, well, the, the way I experienced it was a sense of incredible frustration because I just couldn't. I couldn't, I couldn't find, I could I, anything, please send, let, let me grab anything just to give, you know, just to give me a bit of interest. And you, you enter that period where, and that's nothing to do with, with me, that's not an act of will. You've reached a point now where something else has taken over, something that's beyond your consciousness, beyond what, what you do. And you sit in that, and you sit in that, <clears throat> in that place until that matures and of course you don't know how long that's going to go on for I mean for me it went on it lasted it, it, it kicked in right at the beginning of the retreat actually and it was a couple of weeks something like that. I think I wrote in the book I can't remember two to three weeks two weeks of, of really it was really difficult because I was just so so bored and so thinking what the hell am I doing this for I've just lost all motivation nothing interests me at all and you sit there and when that reaches perfect equilibrium, remember it has to feed itself to live, it falls away, it collapses. And when it collapses, that's the, that's the conditioned, your conditioned mind that you've been enveloped by all of your life, falls away, it then opens into what is reality, the unconditioned, your, your true nature, Buddha nature, the Dharmakaya, Shunyata, all of these words that we wrap around that. So it's not like you die, you do die actually. In, in Zen it's called the great death. One of the, you literally die as a person. You literally die. Well, not physically, but, but you know, well, subjectively. Not physically. Yeah. yeah, well, it's, it, fortunately it doesn't go on so long. <laughs> Uh, it, it is it is it is a complete collapse of your whole conscious makeup but there's a part of you that's not a part of that and that bit that bit is is that bit endures but it's like you just lose all you, you just lose it there's nothing there but there is this knowing there's a knowing there which is beyond this sangsaric world that um that's who you really are that part of you that never dies that's permanent that does this dies 
but this doesn't die. Mm -hmm. And and then after a few moments, it's difficult to put a time on it because you're not in time. Um, but it's clearly not that long as it were, so to speak. The whole world comes, it doesn't just come back as a sort of flash, it comes rushing. Like, you imagine, you imagine like somebody having playing music on the other side of a door and you've got the door closed and you can't hear it. But when you open the door, it, it rushes at you. It doesn't sort of go like that, but it sort of rushes at you. So the whole of your consciousness rushes back. And then when you recover from that, because what the hell was that? That was that was my the first thoughts that came was what what, what was that? And so you just relax. I mean, I just I was on the cushion at the time. I was sitting when this happened. Um, you sit there for a few moments, and then you begin to realise what's happened. You know, which is it's very emotional actually. Um, <clears throat> but then what happens then is that you begin to realise that you know this is this this is it, mate. You've done it. That sounds egotistical, but, you know, you can't help but say that. You say, God. But then it begins to open up. You begin to find yourself in the Dharmakaya. This is, this is reality. You're not in your samsaric world. Your samsaric world is marginalized. And there's a part of the, the, the unconditioned is, is revealing itself. It manifests and you begin to see what is reality yeah. who you really are this is not some objective thing this isn't you're not watching uh, watching a movie this is who you really are this is who we all are that we've got we've thrown a veil over it and got lost in this nonsense that we create and chase after and get caught by but at that time and it that 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 revelation can go on it depends on the person but it becomes clear that, you know, this is reality. And then what happens then? You just begin to see your samsaric world, what it's all about. You know, the Buddha, the Buddha, he, he, one of his famous teachings, one of the cornerstones of his teachings called the Four Noble Truths, is that there is suffering. You don't have to be very clever to see that one. But there is, but there is a cause of suffering. <clears throat> Uh, there is a cause of suffering, and there is a way out of suffering, uh, and there is a path that will take you out of suffering. And that isn't something that he invented. That's something that reveals itself. That's the nature of your samsara. You see it, that that it's nothing but suffering. It's all. It's just an absolute mess that has no beginning in there. That you just go, and, and of course, what totally integral with all of this is 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 the is is the revelation and, and the and the acceptance which westerners so many westerners have a real problem with these days of, of rebirth of karma and rebirth that it's just a continuous flow many of us westerners now that because we can't prove it therefore i don't accept it but you see that this samsaric thing with the energy that it creates the massive energy it just it just rolls on it's like a juggernaut that will do just because your body falls to bits you know you think you think that's the end you must be joking <laughs> what it will do due to circumstances another one gets created and it's literally it doesn't have an end end or a beginning and you're stuck with that all the time and you can see how it how it maintains itself it shows its nature that it is suffering and the reason why why it maintains itself is, be, is because of, of, of your desire that your roles are touching. That's why it exists. And Again, then, but no. then, but oh. then you see there's a way out of suffering. Mm -hmm. That actually there is an end to this. This isn't all doom and gloom. But that you have to go about it in a very, very particular way, and that's called the path. And this is what it will take you to this place that you to this equilibrium, where the whole thing falls away, and it and it reveals you you you, you awaken to your true nature, your, your your Buddha nature, and 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 all the wonders, and all the wonders and inconceivable experience of, of it, which is so emotional, but it's just so full of insight that it just rains down. Continue for me, it just rained down for days. It never stopped, 
everything just revealing itself, show, show, showing itself. And it, and it, it shows its stratas. It shows its stratas of, you know, the, the stratas of reality, if you like. Mm -hmm. that, and, and, it, and, it, and it takes you to the ultimate, which is the, the ultimate of, of shunya. It's all emptiness, it's all shunyata. But shunyata isn't some black and white thing. Shunyata, it's almost like it's got different stratas. And because you experience one up, this is shunyata. Well, it is, but hang on, there's a bit more to this than, 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 than what you've to what you think you, you, you think and, and the ultimate strata is when you see all phenomena <clears throat> is independent is, is, is its own independent thing but at the same time it contains every other thing in the whole universe every other every other element every other form whatever that form not only that but it contains everything that's in the past Everything that's in the future is there in front of you. It's called interpenetration. That's the ultimate of shunyata. That's where you go, you know, as I say, certainly if you go down the path, this, this, the, where, you, where you take on, you, you, you take so much on when you, when you enter this path, that, that, when, that when the fruit finally drops, it's not just a little a little taster, as, as often the case can be, but actually it's it, it's through. And, and you know what's touching it now is, is quantum physics. Yeah. Quantum physics that's now beginning to break through. And what quantum physics? I mean, I have absolutely no trouble with it because it's expressed in reality. This is Shunyata. But you know, we got to we got to go beyond putting it under a microscope or, or making against some objective understanding. For these scientists and these people who are, are very drawn to this, that that, that are, that are uh, being drawn into to un understanding it, sooner or later have got to realise is they really want to understand quantum physics. They've got to turn all of their objective stuff that they're looking into, going out there like all scientists do. They got to, one day they've got to take that and turn it within themselves, and when they do, then they see it in its completeness. Some of them because, are doing that, actually. Some, you know, well, that's fantastic because that's yeah. where it is. Right. That's where it is. It, it isn't an objective reality. It's yeah. who you are. In fact, there are quantum physicists who've been meditating for decades and are kind of, in a scientific way, drawing the correlation between you know, consciousness and the unified field and so on. But um, I wanted to ask you, uh, so this happened to you in 1981, which was 33 years ago, nearly half a lifetime ago for you, and uh, and then you mentioned strata of shunyata. Uh, so in the last 33 years, have you been kind of progressing through these strata, well, or what, what's been well, unfolding well, over 33 years? The, the, way, the way it works, and this is this is one that defeats so many people. Mm -hmm. So many people think, well, that's it. I've finished. I've done it. Right. I've seen. I know. Put my feet up. Got my money's worth. The, Get the cigar out <laughs> and just cruise for the rest of life. Actually, it's only the beginning. Right. Because what you've got, the, the, the way that it works, is that you, you, you have the awakened mind now, mm -hmm. which you never had before. And you can't imagine it. You can't create it. I don't care how smart and clever you are, what imagination. You don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't know the unconditioned mind, which is not necessarily a nice way. You don't, you don't know your true nature until you've awakened to it, until you... You have that, but also you still have the residue of your sangsara. It's not as powerful as it used to be because you have this thing that's undeniable that sits there that you have. You are incapable of doubt. You cannot doubt. You can doubt your practice all the way along. Am I doing it right? Is it right? Am I wasting my time? Etc. Once you break through, you see and you know and nothing, it's unshakable, your doubt is unshakable. I mean, there is no doubt, you cannot doubt the path, you cannot doubt what it leads to. So you have that, like a rock as it were, it always sits there, and you've got this other fellow over here, it's quite good to use two hands here, you've got this other fellow over here, it's the absolute and the relative. You have the relative there, that still wants a piece of the action, It's still always poking its nose in, trying to get you to follow your habits, which you do, and you can still follow quite crude habits. But hopefully if you stick at it, if you stick at it, 
slowly, slowly, and learn. You know, you know the way out of suffering is not to feed it. Leave it alone. Let it fade. It's not good. It's not bad. You don't engage with it. You don't have conflict. Leave it alone. Let it burn itself out like a fire that you no longer throw fuel on. If you want a fire to go out, and you, if you don't throw fuel on it, however big the fire is, sooner or later it's got to go out. It's exactly the same principle. If you don't throw fuel on it, it will it will slowly, slowly burn itself out. And this becomes ever more prominent because there is this, it's trying to cloud it over and, you know, and it, which it succeeds from time to time to some degree, but it's always freeing itself because it's, it's, it's the master, it's, it's the real thing. This is not real, this is pure imagination, a pure, a pure, a pure fiction. 100% fiction, so it has no body, it has no depth, depth and strength to it really, it's more like a, it's a mirage, whereas this is something. So this will, and, and you know Zen, the way Zen describe it is, is, the, is that the practice after the breakthrough is that you protect the advancing host. This is the guest, this is the host, the guest is always interfering, wanting, but you, you, keep, you keep the ship steady. You meditate, you live a lifestyle where you're not feeding this fellow any more than it, you know, any more than it can have. And you and you just dedicate yourself to carrying on with the training. In essence, no different than the first day you started. But now you've got a vision, now you see. And of course, it's different, profoundly different. But at the same time, it's no different. It's no different because you're learning to let go still. Exactly. You're learning to let go. The same as you did on the first day when you came to the training. You're, you're learning to learn. so so the advancing host um you know you, you protect you 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 stay like like the tibetans like to, the tibetans call it the view don't know if you've heard that one. the view where you just you stay present you don't wander off into the future or the past where your feet are what you're doing drinking a cup of tea drinking a glass of water that's it nothing special that's the view that's that's staying with the advancing host just leave it alone because actually it grows itself you don't you don't make it you don't make it become more 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 prominent it, it, it it's it's a natural irreversible process and whether you pull it off in this lifetime maybe or whether whether you don't and you still got this residue here that will then create further lives Nevertheless, you will come back to that, to that. So, so the advancing host. Actually so you're never, saying that even though uh, this awakening has taken place, there can be further lives because of the residue. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's only. So it's not some know, kind it, of ultimate enlightenment. It's, so, it's no, some, no. some sort of stage of awakening. No, it, it is, and it's, and it is, and if it, if it, if it is authentic, mm -hmm. if it's authentic. Um, it's irreversible. Mm -hmm. you, you've you've done something now that you can't turn you can't turn turn back. You can hang it out by buying into your into your old world. By all means, if that's you say, oh, I've had enough of this. I'm going to smoke a cigar every day and do that. Fair enough. And you and you may even sort of really sort of cover it over in your life. But it's it's awakened and it will it will in time. However however many lives and not many. It will, it will, this, 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 um, this guest, this samsara, this, these habits that you've created, that the karma, the karma that you've created will fade. And then that's, that's, that, you know, in, in Buddhism, it's Buddhahood. Okay. You know, that's, that's the Buddha. And that's those that reach Buddha. He's not the only one that's reached that. And there's plenty that have in the time, but there's a whole, there's a whole, path that goes in, 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 in Mahayana Buddhism it's called the Bodhisattva path, mm -hmm. the Bhumis, where you work through, it's called the Bhumi, the ten stages, where you work through the characteristics of this and, and, and the world that it creates, the dualistic world that it creates that you buy into, it begins to unpick it, it begins to unpick so that it slowly, it slowly becomes, uh, you know, impotent. So do you have any way of estimating how much of it you've worked through in the past 33 years and how much there's le left to work through? No, no idea. No idea. No. <laughs> I love, I love, I, I like tomorrow would be nice, but um, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. You've got attachment around these things. Mm -hmm. It's one of, you know, 
we are we are nothing but creatures of attachment we do it all the time this this you just got to let go trust it go with it you know do your best be as committed as you can not be not be you know not be half-hearted yeah but at the same time, you see, this is so difficult to be to be wholehearted, to be wholehearted, and I think this is one of the ultimate challenges for all of us to be wholehearted with what you do, but not want anything in return. So I knew you, you were. You you get yourself into that place where you are wholehearted with your training, mm -hmm. but you have no you you have no. I'm not doing this because I want to get that. Right. You do it for its own sake, mm -hmm. which is to become a human being. And you know it's you're humanizing it is that whole path is just about becoming a human being for as long as you're a human being it's it's the innate qualities that our buddha nature have so they begin to shine through of compassion of love of forgiveness empathy all of these qualities that we all admire in people you don't make any of these you don't make them they're inherent within all of us that they're an expression of our true nature and so, and so you begin to you begin to experience that you be and you and you know how right it is and how good you feel about becoming a human being, and you just want to carry on because it's a lovely place to be, you know. Not like you used to be in the old days when you just spend your life, you know, running after things and people and wanting this and wanting crashing and banging all over the place so you get your own way. Now you just you you just let go and 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 allow the thing to unfold, and when it ends, who knows? I yeah. don't know. I knew you were going to give me that answer, but I just wanted to ask. But uh, <laughs> but aside from that, though, um, how if, if if it's possible, how would you describe the nature of your day to day, moment to moment experience now, as compared to mm. ten, twenty, thirty years ago? Is, do you see a tra a trajectory of yeah, and, yeah. And as you walk down the street now? What is the or as you sit talking to me? What is the nature of your experience as compared to what it was uh, you know when you first had that awakening or a week or a year after that awakening on attachment much more so yeah you just learn to go with things yeah. things don't things don't bother you in the set things sort of pass through you okay. you have you have much more of a lightness mm. you don't you don't carry you don't carry this self burden which is that that's gone um, even though all of this stuff is just associated with a notion of it, because the self is just a, is just a creation. Right. It doesn't, it's never existed. It's a phenomenon that, that manifests when the conditions are right. And when the conditions break up, the notion of a self disappears. So that, that, that self notion can still pop around, but it, it only takes the other part of you just to hang on a minute and just have a quick look. Mm -hmm. Say no, 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 and it just vanishes. So if you and had that, to... and that and that happens, you know that happens on on a you know I I I I run a group with lots of people, and you can imagine things don't always go the way that you want them to go, and that's all part of the you know that's part of my training is that I do my best, and I can see if there's any self of me in there, or whether I'm prepared to to, to let things unfold more more naturally and sort of rather help rather than hinder mm. you know whether whether all the students would agree with that and I, I don't know but certainly where I'm coming from um, everything is so easy, so easy I don't feel like I'm carrying anything right. I really I, I don't I don't think I'm even carrying life to be honest with you and the desire for life I, but at the same time I'm prepared to live it wholeheartedly that's the paradox mm -hmm. The first time we use the word paradox. Yeah, we'll have to get into that. That's that, that's that's the paradox there, that 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 um, you know, like I say, you give yourself wholeheartedly, but at the same time, you know that it's all just a it's a game. It's yeah. just a game, you know. Don't okay. don't don't get carried away by it. So, if you were to take one yardstick by which you could measure the <clears throat> the development that's taken place in the last thirty three years, it would be growth of unattachment, spontaneity, smooth, ease, ease of, of, of living, just kind of a... There is, there is that, and of course what makes that possible is not a, is not a thought process, it's also the growing realisation of shunyata. Yeah. Shunyata is, is, is eternal peace. I'm not suggesting no. it's something you're thinking about, it's just the, the way you naturally function. Yeah. 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 
but, but but everything but everything as it matures and the more and the more you let go certainly in the beginning it can be it can still be quite difficult in the beginning but you like you like after years that the whole notion of shunyata becomes more and more sits in front of you much more and when shunyata sits in front of you then you don't grab at anything yeah okay good <laughs> so um in the notes you sent to me, you said, I've been listening to many non-dual talks lately and have been struck by the difference in how reality is revealed to the non-dual adherent and the Buddhist practitioner. I'd like to talk on this difference, not from theory, but from my own direct experience of awakening. <clears throat> and as you know, uh, you know, it's a topic that has come up in a lot of my interviews. In fact, somebody sent me this t-shirt. Oh, well, there you go. Has paradox. <laughs> has paradox on it. And um, <laughs> so, and I read in your book about the discussion of paradox and how there are a lot of non-dual teachers out there these days saying you're, you're already awakened, you're already enlightened, you don't need to do anything, so on and so forth. Yeah. And, and then you discuss, uh, you know, how they're, they're perhaps just kind of stuck in an absolute view and the absolute and the relative both have to be taken into account. So let's discuss yeah. that whole area for a bit. Mm -hmm. Well, to be able, this is, this is where... I, I think it's the, the freedom of the freedom of insight that your insight is is, is an authentic insight, a, a rounded insight. Is that like the paradox? Here you are, you have the absolute, where you have you know you have your enlightened nature. Everything is perfect. You don't make anything. You don't go anywhere. There's nothing to do, nothing to be. But at the same time. You've got the relative world where you're caught up in all the daily activities, where you're caught up in the in, in the self's desires and stuff. And and like for a teacher and, and for your own for your own understanding of yourself, you run the two side by side, and of course they don't make it doesn't make sense. You have that, and and I think unless you, unless unless in your training, you have specifically focused. This, this is what's really important, I think. Unless you specifically specifically focused on the relative aspect of yourself, i.e. your sansara, your suffering, and spent literally years looking at it. You don't get, you don't wade yourself through that in a short time. If you don't, if you don't wade yourself through that and get, and get to know it, then you're not, you're not going to know it. And you have an experience of this thing that suddenly pops out of nowhere, this thing is reality, I've seen reality. You have no, you have no experience, no knowledge of, 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 of the relative, of the paradox. You see yourself one-sided and you can see it. I've, you know, I've listened to people, so many people. The thing, that, the thing that immediately gets the bell going for me is when people have their enlightened experience and immediately go and write a book they, they, they make a video and they go out and teach. They immediately they become a teacher. As soon as somebody does that, I think there's, there's something not right here. You, you, you've, you've missed something here. Because if you think that you've cracked it, that you've done it, and you can sit with your cigar smoking, I don't think it works that way. I think what you've done, you've had a taste. And I would never, I would never put myself in the place of judging people of the, of the authenticity of their awakening. But what so many people don't seem to realize that that reality isn't what isn't a thing it isn't this is reality reality isn't a thing at all it has no parameters no colors it's not an object in any way so therefore you can't pin it down and say this is reality you can get a taste you can certainly get a, a taste a touch of it but hang on you you've you've that there's there's an awful lot more to this than than what you've experienced but 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 the difficulty with this and i totally appreciate this again from my own experience that when you get a taste of reality a taste of something well let's say a taste of something that's beyond your normal condition dualistic world the experience can be so so powerful like nothing that you've experienced in your life i don't know what you've done in your life but everything pounds into insignificance that you are so utterly convinced this is it this has got to be the the, the real thing that 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 you become so attached to that that you think well as i say i've done it i'm 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 i'm, I'm fully awakened i'm now going to go and spread the word to everybody but what you don't have that you don't have the experience of a path. So when these people come along to you and say, and, and be very inspired by your story and very interested by your story, say, of course, fantastic. How do I do it? 
And you say, well, just let go because, because you're awakened anyway. Just let all that nonsense go. And then you go, well, hang on a minute. You might be able to do that, but I can't. I'm just completely stuck with my, with my, with my self-identity. How, 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 how do I work on that self-identity so that I can get to your place? That self-identity, that's the path. And if you haven't walked the path, you cannot know it. I don't care how. I don't care what your enlightenment is. If you've not walked the path and seen the subtleties and see the utter, utter amazing way it is constructed, you think it's just something very simply put. In, it is not. The subtlety of it is beyond. It is beyond your imagination. You cannot know. It is so clever the way that it, it has ways of holding you. You, you. you can't know that until you've gone on that journey yourself and seen it. So when people come to you, and this is what I've been bolt so many times, I've heard people talk about their experience, and I like, oh, that's really, really interesting. And I always wait for the punchline at the end. And there isn't a punchline, because they, A, they just talk about themselves all the time. And then you say, yeah, great, but how do I do it? Or just wake up, when well, you can't do it. 99.9% .9 of us can't do that. Right. 99% of us need help and support and we need we need to work our way through the thing that's preventing us from waking up and that thing is this is the is the relative is samsara is 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 the, is the identifying with the self is the world that we create that we live in that we're attached to that is who we consider to be this is me this that can totally consumes us that's what you have to work through in order to to experience and Buddhism Buddhism is that's what Buddhism is it's about working through that well it doesn't care about the absolute it will take care of itself okay it can be an inspiration it can be interesting but hang on just because you know a bit about it that's not going to help you you've got to learn you've got to learn to let go you've got to learn to become let go of your attachment to put it simply but it's not a simple simple thing to do we, to, to, to truly to let go means you're letting go of the self and you're and you are you are volunteer you're volunteering dying as a self as a self entity as a separate self entity you're giving that up you don't do that doesn't happen that doesn't happen by an act of will and it doesn't happen easily you have to learn to work through it and it takes years mm -hmm. it takes years so th this is the bit that throws me when i hear this these people with their wonderfully interesting, inspiring stories is great for them, but I don't see what use, other than inspiring, I don't see what use it is for, because as I say, most of us, we need help. Please hold your hand and, and, and just, I know I've got to do it, and I know it's a paradox, and I know that none of this really exists, because I believe you, but reality is the only thing that real, and all the thing that I'm caught by that 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 define my life i know it's all imagination none of it's real it's all, but still for me it's real and i can't let it go yeah. how do i let that go well you know that's in buddhism it's clearly 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 mapped out yeah uh, i mean this, the uh, buddha didn't say oh, okay folks you're all enlightened congratulations you can go home no, now you know <laughs> even though absolutely right he, he, Absolutely he gave not. them practices and techniques and, and you know, and the, the, this, go ahead. No, I'll just say that this is, this is where I, no, no, because I have my own personal experience here, this is not just an interesting subject. Sure, yeah. I have my own experience with this. And, and of course I do take a bit of interest when I hear of, when I hear about other peoples and people are so much out there and in your face with this that I, I've got to look at it and compare it to my, to my understanding and see that there's just there's, there's so much missing here yeah. it's so, okay for you and i and i would doubt while people while people sit in the absolute and say to say to the people that come to their meetings just let go just let go to me that clearly displays to me that they that they don't know about the relative I'm not they, even they, sure all of them know about the absolute. I mean, I've talked no, to a no, lot no, of these no. people. No, 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 well, okay, but they think they do. <laughs> yeah. But, but but this but this is where the word paradox comes in. Right. This is what the, they stand on one side. It's like this. What they can't do is is step to the other side, which is a complete contradiction to what you've just said. Mm -hmm. But actually, be comfortable with that because it is a paradox. The, the, this the, this isn't black. This isn't black and white. And and 
and and you know two two dimensional and some and some lateral reality. That's not how it is, and that's 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 you know that's 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 what I struggle with with this and the fact that people you know for me if I can say you know I'm talking to you like this. You know whether people want to believe it or not. You know that's that's another thing, but but you know in Buddhism, what I've been talking about, being so open with you, is a taboo for most Buddhist traditions. It's not done. It's not. It's just not. There are plenty of people within it, within the traditions who do break through, but they don't get up and they don't talk about it in direct ways. Their teachings express their understanding. They don't get up and say, "Look at me, I'm this and I'm that." Um, but because I'm not actually, I don't belong. I'm not affiliated or or committed to any specific traditions. This what, what is it? What is a? It's not a major issue, but it's something. It's something that you don't do in any of the traditions. And I've always struggled with why that. Why these people don't get up and say, "I'm broke." I, I've always struggled with that, with that. I can understand some of the reasons why not, but but also it can be incredibly positive to to, to say to people, you know, I've, I've broken through, and then it can be very inspiring. And I now have history of actually coming out, as I call it, <laughs> which is goes back, whatever it is, fifty. Uh, Thirty-three years. No, 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 oh. no, no. When I, no, no, no. When I, when I, no, no. When I, when I. I mean, I carried this. I carried this for for um, eighteen years mm -hmm. before, before I'm saying anything. I, I wrote a manuscript um, back in the late eighties for my own amusement. Threw it in a, in a desk and left it there for years, and then took it out some years later, cleaned it up, and to my to my surprise, um, somebody offered to publish it. I sent it to Sangharachita, who's the founder of the what's now called the Tree Ratner community. It's, um, um, it used to be called the FWBR. I mean, it's a worldwide. Uh, and I sent I sent my manuscript to him because I knew he's the only person I knew that would be able to to run over my manuscript and see it from a technical point of view whether there's any problems with it. If he saw any sort of something, things things were wrong. Um, and to my surprise, he wrote back and he, he liked what he saw and he said, well, look, maybe I could get this published for you. And when the book came out, which is 18 years, 18 years after the event, I went public, as it were, and I wrote about, I, I, I specifically, my first book, my record of awakening actually is more, actually talks about that, that, that experience. Mm -hmm. But it took me 18 years before I came out. You know, I didn't get up there after five minutes and start exclaiming. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and what, what you, what, what, what needs to be realised in those 18 years of was I've maturing. You know, it would have been so different if I'd have got out there, you know, a few weeks after and started, I don't know, proclaiming something or other. It's so different to what it would be now. Because sure. now I've had, I've had all these years of, of maturity, of, of polishing, as I like to say, more clarity around the whole, uh, the whole phenomenon, the whole experience um, that, um, you know, and that, that, that actually is traditional. Yeah. You know, the people, people take years and years and years before they come out and, 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 and as I say, sort of expose themselves like that. But when I see, when I see so much of the stuff that's going on now, they can't get out there quick enough. Yeah. Most of them. And I'm. Well, I've even heard of, of heard stories of people in in various satsangs saying, "Jesus, I can't wait till I get awakened so I can quit my shitty job and get out there and be a be a teacher." Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a there's a Tibetan proverb you may have heard, which is, uh, "Don't mistake understanding for uh, realization. Don't mistake realization for liberation." And I think there's a, a lot of people who they attain an understanding of the non-dual nature of things and you know the enlightened nature of the self and all that stuff and mistake that understanding for for realization um, and actually begin teaching without really ha having been grounded in the experience um, and uh, you know what to say of, of a more mature thing that might happen years after an, an actual awakening 
And it's kind of like, and, and then they, they're saying to people, oh, you're already that, you're already enlightened, you don't need to do anything. It's, it's sort of like your Aunt Matilda, you know, bequeaths you a fortune, and, and someone tells you, hey, you're a millionaire, and you start running around the street saying, I'm a millionaire, I'm a millionaire, but you actually haven't figured out how to access the bank account, so you're still living mm. like a pauper, you know? Mm. You still can't mm. afford to pay your rent and whatnot because you, ha you actually haven't gotten your hands on that money. Yes, um, yes. So I think there's there's a lot of that too, where people sort of have this this kind of they talk the talk in terms of being enlightened mm -hmm. and be and they kind of understand that essentially we all are in that sense. My dog is, but there's not the actual living experience of it. Mm -hmm. And that you know, and I find that I find that sad because a lot of people are buying into that because it's something you can buy into so easily. Sure, be sitting on a cushion for ten years. Abs up precisely <laughs> you can buy you can buy into that you know genuine people who are looking who are looking to to, to to get to the bottom of you know the human condition that this is what this is what they really want to do and their first contact is to come up against something that there is no way it's not going to happen for them I'm sorry you need a teacher you cannot do this without a teacher mm. and you need the right support around you while you borrow and when you get to know so things fall away so that so that reality begins to begins to open up for you that's the way that it's done you're not going to do this on your own and if you've woken up on your own and i don't deny that that you've had a taste of reality but don't think that's that's the end of the that's the end of that is reality you've tasted it you've licked it you've touched it fantastic take it as an inspiration don't take it as a, something to attach yourself to and get out there and say, I've done it. Take it, wow, I've touched, you know, I've gone beyond all this nonsense. That is fantastic. Then go and find somebody who's, who can help you mature that, who can help to bring you into the relative, because that's where you've got to go. You don't have to go into reality anymore. You have to go into the relative. And if you've not, if you've not been guided into it, you, you you won't you won't you won't wade through on your own however smart and clever you are because of the subtle nature of the whole thing and and the, the sheer difficulty of it you need the right emotional support this is an emotional journey this is not an intellectual one this isn't cerebral this whole this whole path is emotional isn't there a, both components to some extent? There, yes yes there, yes of course there is there is there is there is a, a place for that but it's only a part because it helps to guide you and orientate and you can say yeah i understand and sure you need that but when you come to actually put it into practice you will find that it's in the body it's not in the head it's in the body you've got to learn to come into the body turn away from a lifetime of habits of, of doing everything in your head learn to come into your body to be still to be open and learn to trust that you find them have no no logic it's, it's, it, it doesn't fit your conditioning, it doesn't fit common sense half the time. You have to learn to trust that and go with that, and you're not going to do that on your own. Right. Somebody, somebody who you trust, who can, who, can, who can put their arm on your shoulder and say, just keep going, just keep going. And then, and then you get to know the relative, you know? And until you know the relative, you're not going to know, you're not going to, the absolute, because the absolute is where you call it nirvana and sangsara, if you like, they're not too not do but but for so many people you just get a taste of of, of, of the absolute somehow it's it, it's something separate and, and waft you know this 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 you 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 you're, you're just scratching you you're just scratching around yeah Ad, adyashanti gives some nice talks about that too <clears throat> i don't know if you know who he is but yes uh, I've... you know how how a taste of of realization can seem like the whole thing and one can be tempted to go out and teach and consider oneself done and all that stuff but it's just a taste and there's there's much more mm. so maybe we've covered that topic you, you also said buddha nature i'd like to take the opportunity if possible <laughs> to talk on how buddhist practice is generally evolving now in the west much tinkering yeah. is and has been put on the traditional ancient ways of practice to the extent that i think we are running the serious risk of throwing the baby out with the bathwater making mm. authentic awakening increasingly difficult to achieve. 
And then you, you, you mentioned your group, which is a wholly Western group, yet has not added to nor subtracted from the essence of the traditional mm. way of Dharma mm. practice. Mm. Go ahead and talk about that a bit. Yeah, well, I'd like, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to use that as a model, my, my group, mm -hmm. which again is something that I have to say, I, I've, I mean, I'm, so you get the right, you get the right picture here. I have never set out to be a teacher. I've never set out to be, to, to run a group. It's only when my book came out, people wanted to come and sit with me. Mm -hmm and I couldn't chase them away. They just kept coming back and coming back. And so that you, you sit and then, hello, let's have a day retreat and on, and on it goes. And then, and, then you, and, then, and then you have a group and you hang on, well, I didn't start out to do this. It takes care of itself. I mean, that's part of the mystery of all of this right. and the part of that, of that connection with, with the mysterious part of yourself. If you open, it, 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 will, it will take you, it will take you on the path. One thing it will leads open. to the next. Absolutely, and you don't have to do anything about it. And, um, you know, I found myself teaching, which I've never had that ambition in my life. And it actually terrified me, the fact of getting up and talk. When my book came out, um, when my book came out, I had to do, I had to do um, book launches. I've never, I've, I've shied away from any, anything public, getting up in front of people since I was a young teenager, when I didn't mind, suddenly the, <laughs> suddenly the curtains drew. And I've, it's terrified me all my life. But when this book came out, I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to have to get up and talk about this. And that, you know, it took and a lot of so much fear I had to go through there. But slowly, you know, fears about familiarity, you stay with it and eventually it fades away. You don't feed it, you know, and all, all of those things. And it fades. Weren't, and weren't I found, the one who said you used to be a rock drummer? Oh, that was back before yeah. before I came to the practice. I, I used to also. So you got you, you had some experience with audiences anyway. Yeah, and and <laughs> no, but you know, the great thing about the great thing about a drum kit is you can hide behind yeah, it. Yeah, you're in the background. Nobody can see you. You're not the lead if you, singer. If your if your seat if your seat's low enough and your cymbals are high enough, <laughs> you, you can hide there. Nobody, you, you know, always in the background. So yeah. that that never counted. Uh, and you had a, you know anyway. You didn't do solos. Oh please, no, no, I didn't. I, 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 well, it wasn't that good. You're just a rhythm man. It. I didn't, I didn't stick at it long enough to to get get to that place. Oh, okay, it was great. I enjoyed it. It was fantastic. I loved it. But you know, that was something just passing through. Um, and so I just, I just want to, you know, to tell you where I am today. Sure. Is that you know I've ended up. I found myself teaching, but you, you've heard some of my talks. You know, we've got over 50 on the Dharma my website at this moment. And I, the way I've been talking today about me personally, you will hardly ever find anything on there where I talk about myself. It's, but what you do here exclusively is what's come out of that, that come out of that awakening process. I mean, this is, this is not me that speaks when I sit down in front of front of the group. I don't sit there. It just it comes as it does for a lot of people, um, and that's just an expression of that of that of that opening of that uh, uh, of that awakening, and that's been a natural that's been a natural thing for me that the group that the group has the group has formed. I found myself as a teacher. I didn't even want to call myself a teacher until about three or four years ago. I even recall I never used to ever call myself a teacher. I just found it so pretentious because I've got so much to learn, so much to learn. How can you get up there and say I'm a teacher when you, you know, you're floundering? Well, you've got issues just like everybody else. So I've always, I've always had difficulty with it, but now I'm comfortable with it, and I am a teacher because everyone tells me I'm a teacher, so I have to, I have to, I have to get on with it. But what they get from me is what's come out of, it, 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 it's what you know it's my own it's my own expression of my, of my own awakening but everything since i've since i've come to the dharma has been within the, the traditional form and so i proved to myself that it works that there's nothing wrong with it if it works don't fix it why would i want to go tinkering with something if i find myself with my own group and my own disciples it seems like people want to do things to put their own identity on their group, like us Westerners. So they start tweaking things and they, and they drop things and they begin to take away things that they don't consider to be important, like the whole devotional side, the whole, like, like, like bowing, for example, any, any sense, like the way I talk about opening up to your, to your, um, you know, to, 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 
to what is what, what we call Buddha nature, your, your own your own true nature, that that because you can't prove these things, and this is how the Western mind works, that in time they begin to shore off everything that can't be written down in a textbook that you can't think through, that's not logical, that doesn't that doesn't have just straight lines to it. I think they've done it with Indian, with Indian, Indian traditions. I think um, you, you know the, the non-dual comes from um, Advaita. I mean, I'm, I don't know that but the, the bit that I've touched on Advaita is so much richer and so much for ah, we don't need all that Eastern mumbo jumbo. We we'll just chop it off. We get down to the bare bones, and they've done it in Buddhism with with vipassana, which is an ancient form of practice. But it's it's it, and it and it died really, a hundred years, hundred and fifty, wherever we are now, hundred years ago, beginning of the last century, and it got revived, and when it got it came into into the Western perspective, just chopping all this all this traditional sangha stuff, Theravada stuff away. Let's just get down to the, the, the nitty gritty, just just that, and, and consider all this stuff to be not not necessary, that it's all just flowery stuff, because it's irrational. You, you can't say, well, we, we bow our heads because it's, you, you can say why, but you can't g give a rational reason for doing that. It has some sort of tangible product to it. Um, and so oh, we won't do that. And now, and now you get, and I discovered some years ago, um, that they even throw Buddha Rupas out. There's no, they don't even bother with Buddha Rupas. I mean, I came across that one. Buddha Rupa means Buddha? the statue of the Buddha? The statue, I yeah. See, right. Yeah. Like, like you have there. Like my friend here, yeah. looking over my shoulder. Keeping an eye uh, on Keeping it, yeah, he's very close. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the, people don't know why they're there. They think it's just a idol, that it's just a statue, and you don't need it. But in fact, it can be one of the most supportive, the most one of the most insightful things that you can have in your practice. Mm -hmm. um, but because it's, there's no rationale around it, we'll chuck it out. And in Vipassana, that's got so sanitized that they've thrown, away, they've thrown out so much as an example. And I think, as I say, with Advaita, it's the same thing. Yeah. I, think it's, I think it's a direct parallel, actually. It's what Westerners do. You don't get this in the East. It's how our minds, we're rational, we're intelligent, I understand everything. If it doesn't fit my intelligence, then I don't want it. Right. So I can, I can, I can, I can hone it all down and get rid of it. So well, let me ask you a two-part question about that. Um, one I is put a nature yet. Oh, we're going to get to it. We have time. Let, okay. let me a two-part question about this. One is, <clears throat> are you pretty confident that what has traditionally come down over the last couple thousand years is what the Buddha would have intended, or did some of the early pract practitioners add on a lot of frills. Well, and so the, that's the first part of the question. So, second part is when you, you, I'm not really familiar with Buddhist tradition too much, but I, from what I understand, there's a lot of, a lot of details. I mean, a lot of stuff about subtle beings and bardos and uh, all uh, uh, kinds uh, uh, of stuff. And, yeah, and so, you know, do we, do we really want all that? No, you know? no we don't. You, do you, you don't, unless you have a particular practice in that way. No, that, that's true. We don't need that. But I'm actually talking about specific practices. Okay. Um, the, 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 the techniques. So you're not stuff. guilty of throwing out a lot of stuff yourself by ignoring some of that stuff I just referred to. No, it doesn't. It doesn't apply to our particular training. Our, the one, the, our training has a parallel in Chan, in in Zen. Ah, Zen. So it's more and bare if, bones. If, absolutely. Yeah. It 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 it, um, it, it doesn't. It, it's very it's very simple and very direct. There's, right. there's very little, you know, s stuff around it. Right. Um, so that's very easy for us in the West because we don't. There's not a lot of stuff. Not a lot of clutter. Not a lot of clutter around it. But that, but that's that's when I, being around Theravada, knowing the value of that type of that vipassana practice, and knowing the difference between how tradition is done and how you'll get monks and nuns now Westerners who are part of the tradition, how they practice it compared to it, it's just like a conveyor belt. I mean, I, I, it, it's san, it's sanitized. It's sanitized. Mm. And, and, and what's, there is that, but the, the bit that's closer to my heart, I have to say, is that again, because it, it's irrational, because you can't put your finger on it, because it, you can't give a logic to it, like I'm trying to tell you this 
well, I, what, what I what I what I now know is my, my my true nature. I thought was out there is actually my, my true nature. That's that's willing to, to and it, and it's and I wrote my first book how it helped me when I was on the point of insanity. I mean, that's how big it is. It's not some superficial side issue that some like a pet or something. It can be it can be a massive massive part. To, to the unfolding of your understanding, because ultimately that's where you're going. It's not an alien. It, it, ultimately, you're waking to, your, to, to that true nature. So, so to, to, to embrace it and to acknowledge it, even though you can't prove it, and it is an act of faith, or an act of trust. trust. Trust all the masters through the centuries have told you about Buddha nature, going right the way back. Trust that actually, hang on, did they get it wrong? Have they all got it wrong? Have they seriously all got it wrong? Or, you know, are they just trying to wind me up? Or they're lying to me? Or actually, can I give them the benefit of the doubt until I can prove it to myself? You've got to have that mind, give them the benefit of the doubt. Because if you don't, you will never see it. And what's happening now, because because it's not something rational, it's not something that, that, that you can that you can put put into the into the into the conditioned world um to me this is the spiritual path how, i don't know how you i mean uh, how, how you define the spiritual path if you're going to stay in the logical mind from the beginning to the end you're never going to leave that's not a spiritual path spiritual path is to open up to something that's in the unconditioned something that that that, that you aspire to that you don't understand that that, that you'll never grasp but you trust and you know very often just your own intuition, never mind your own direct experience with that. But the important thing is to open to it and say yes and embrace it. And you can, you can, be, you can begin to recognize it in your life. It is, not, it is not such a great mystery as we like to think that it, that it is. But because, but because it doesn't fit the formulas and all the, and all the razzmatazz with all of those things, there are people who say, oh, that's just a lot of nonsense, we don't need Buddha nature. Or, you, you, you either reject it for that reason, because it's, it doesn't, it's, it's irrational, or, hang on, Buddha nature says that you're already enlightened. Therefore, therefore, you're going to get people who think, well, I'm already enlightened, I haven't got to practice. You know, which, personally, in 40 years, I've never come across anybody who said that. And if, and if anybody did misunderstand that, that, that your enlightened nature is permanent and it's with you and it's who you really are, then you educate them. You don't react and block it all off. So, oh no, we can't go there, it's too dangerous. You have to educate people into, 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 into that, that it's, that it's a, the cornerstone, the cornerstone of, of this type of practice, this, this so-called imminent model that you get in, in, in Tibetan Buddhism, in, in Dzogchen and, and Zen, Chan, it's the cornerstone, your, your, your true nature, and people are dumping it. They're what have dumping. they got left if they dump that? Well, they've got their own head and their own ideas, hmm. which they're happy with. But I'll tell you what, they won't find their true nature. I mean, why do they even bother paying any attention to Buddhism or Buddhist practice if, well, if well, they maybe, reject true nature or direct, reject well, Buddha, Buddha nature? Well, what, what else is there to, to well, well, concern well, yourself maybe, with? Yeah, well, maybe because there is a lot of there is a lot of stuff around these days. Meditation is 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 very very popular, very common. Most of it is derived from Buddhism, or a lot of it's derived from Buddhism. But it's it, that that whole religious side. My God, religion! We mustn't use that word. That whole spiritual side has been ejected, and you do end up with something that works. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm not saying that you won't get anything out of practices like that. I'm not saying that. Of course they work and people can get an awful lot. It can change their lives. But it's only it's only scratching the surface. It won't go deep. It won't fulfill the promise that you will get if you if you if you learn if, if you if you take it on without throwing the baby out. And I know with I say with my group, um, how could I possibly throw the baby out when I know that it works? I proved it to myself. So are these people who are that, that throwing works. out Buddha nature, are they people who might be just doing meditation practice for, no, I, for stress I, release or something? Is that what you're well, saying? Well, They're that, kind that's of fine. That's dumbing fine. it down? But, but don't, yeah, sure, people, and that's fine, but don't call it Buddhism. Right. 
you know, don't hide, don't hide behind Buddha saying I've got a Buddhist practice, but I'm doing it, I'm doing it on my terms. Of course, one thing may lead to the next. They might be doing it for stress release for a couple of years, and, and then begin to realize, oh, there's more to this that is beginning to unfold here. Fantastic. Well, then they must go and seek a teacher, a, a, a traditional teacher where things have been proved, where they haven't thrown the baby out. Mm. And you and you will go and you will go to well, you'll go to Theravada, you go to Zen, you go to Tibetan Buddhism because. Although I'm, 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 Theravada doesn't acknowledge Buddha nature, but but Zen and 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 um, Zen and Tibetan do. So if that's something, then you go there. Then then you if you've got a, a traditional form given to you by the teacher and the, the thing, then you know that that will then be a part of your training. And you know we've been throwing around the term Buddha nature, but I don't know if you quite defined it. What is Buddha nature? Well, but well, true nature. You true nature. It. Your in, your essence. Your innermost. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Okay. I mean, it's just it's just it's original nature. If that's you like. what I figured you meant. But I just want yeah, to make no, sure no, we're no. That's, about the same that, thing. That's, I'm, I'm I'm too conditioned into Buddhism. <laughs> it's uh, that that that's that's uh, uh, my uh, my fear. My fear is that this sanitizing, which has happened in in Vipassana. Is, is happening now in, in to me is is, is um, you know is, is the training that that I partake of and have used and is what I give to my disciples my, my, my students um, I fear well I know it's happening I know it's happening this is not just a, a theory I, I know people are, are, are rejecting that and and if they think that somehow they're going to awaken to their to their true nature by turning their back on it, it, it can't happen. You shut the door. Hmm. This is subtle. This is subtle. It's not going to come crashing through the door any more than you're going to come crashing through the door. You have to turn to it, open to it, and find what what you need to put in place so the door opens so that you begin to touch and begin to to to, to awaken to who you really are. It requires requires that trust to do that and if you don't have that one it, it, it cannot it cannot it cannot happen so this stuff must be fairly and widespread I'm, for you to be so concerned about it the well, you know, people it, who well, are I, well, well well i know it i know it i know I, you, you encounter it a lot i i i've seen well i'm, I'm actually I, I don't i don't get around a lot at all but i do know that i do you can read about it's it out and there stuff. Yeah. I, it's, it's definitely out there mm. so so you need you know you know you need authentic teachers mm -hmm. to, to, who, who are who, who are not going to compromise what are what are the essential principles of of of, of a path that will that will take you to that to that that, that realization and do you see uh, are, are there you know a fair number of authentic teachers around aside from yourself i mean are, I, 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 I i i don't go there they're around they're around but there's a lot um you know, I'd, I'd rather not go there because then it becomes well. I'm making judgments anyway, but yeah. I'm not. You know, <laughs> but are you reasonably that, confident that either in the U.S. or the U.K., if there's somebody who's interested in all this stuff, they if if they use a little scrutiny and, and care in, in checking out teachers, they're going to be able to find somebody. Well, they should, and, and where you start and where you go is you, you go and find traditional Buddhism, not some Western person who's got up and and and, and devised their own their own practice, their own path, chuck this out, put something else, put something new in. Or they find uh, a Western person such as yourself who is adhering to traditional Buddhism, right? It doesn't have well, to be a, a, a... No, no, exactly. But I don't know how many people there are like me around. Because mm -hmm. you see, the th what, what sets my group apart is that we're not actually aligned to any tradition, even I'm telling people to go to a tradition. Mm -hmm. Because what they're getting from me has come from tradition and I haven't I haven't compromised it in any way at all other than other than other than the sort of bells and whistles that the cultural stuff you know we don't pretend we don't pretend to be Japanese or Chinese we are Westerners but the form and the practice that we have I'm I'm very confident to say that it is totally authentic it is untouched it is I've not I've not fiddled with it in any way in in the name of of, of, of West, us Westerners are different, therefore we got to practice different. I don't, I don't. You don't buy that. I, I don't, I don't, the, the, only, the only thing I would say, the, the only, the only aspect I would say, um, you know, looking at it from that perspective is the, the difference between Westerners and Easterners. We are all humans, we've all got the same stuff. Um, 
the only the only thing is is to give more emphasis for West, Westerners need to give more emphasis on their relationship with themselves because most of us Westerners don't like ourselves and that that historically I don't believe is the case in the East it was never a subject about people not liking themselves it's just what but we are so heavily we are so heavily you know created into this individual to get out there and be successful in the world me me against the world that individual very very intelligent got so much uh, but, but what that does is it it, it it feeds it makes the self very heavy because yeah. it's all self it's all self and we end up and we end up we end up not liking ourselves and i think if there is an emphasis which is still still within the traditions it's still this is not outside of it but maybe we need to give a little bit more attention to our to be aware of our relationship with ourselves and to see that this is this is nothing more than a than a path of learning to like yourself <laughs> this is all this is nothing mystical about this this is nothing more than healing um you know the the, the, the fracturedness of that we've, we've turned ourselves into the conflict that we have with ourselves that bit that bit you can you can incorporate that in in a traditional form without because it is a part of the but we, i think more emphasis is is justified because to me that's the one thing that makes us different to eastern people the rest of it we're all still imbued with greed hatred and delusion we're all as daft as each other and we've all got the same desires and which i mean you know it's it's, it's 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 the species it's the species um and I think I, in, I, the, in, in the Buddhist circles that would be, you know, comparable to the governing bodies that approve physicians to, you know, once to, to ensure that they have the right training and certification. Uh, is there anything like that that sort of puts its stamp well, of approval on, on Buddhist this, teachers? This, this, is, this is, to me, is the, is the, you know, can be the, be the nub of the issue. It's so difficult, and I, don't, and I don't expect anything is new about this. This is so nebulous. This whole thing. When you talk about awakening, of, of getting of getting your of getting your awakening authenticated, well, traditionally you'd go to your teacher, and they would say yes or no, and they may give you permission to teach. You may get a title, and stuff, but it, it is it is a stamp of approval. That, that this is genuine and you've got it from somebody who is also qualified to give that approval but you know how many people are like that in the world where can you go and it's not and, and most of it's all sort of secrecy anyway that it, it it's very very difficult but i would say to somebody if they have if they are convinced that they've broken through and and, and you know they've they, they, they've realized their, their their true nature go and seek somebody who was also awakened that may not be an easy thing to do it doesn't have to be of your tradition get a second opinion because 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 it takes one to recognize one right and you can go because you're not of that tradition you can go and you can talk about how things have opened up for you they will know hmm. you know they've only got to look at you and they'll know and then they'll say yes this is this is authenticated if you don't, then who's to say that it's real? Yeah. You know, for me, for me, you know, I was given that, I was given that stamp. Actually, I was given it by three, three people who I, as it so happened, um, who, 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 who I would consider to be, um, have the authority to do that. And when you do that, then fair enough, then you go off and you can, you still may have a lot to do with your own practice. Like I was saying, you know, you're only starting it in some ways, and you've got to be very, very careful because you can turn this into a head trip so easy. Mm -hmm. This can be, this can be such an ego trip. The, the power that it can give you, that we've seen so often, is 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 really rebounded on so many people. Um, but it's one of the dangers that you have to be awake to and be alive to, and see that you don't fall into that into that trap. But if but if it matures, then you can you can then go and do. You know, you can you can start and express express your awakening. Not get a, not not express your your awakening in, in direct terms, but, but 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 the understanding, the Dharma that comes through, through through that when everything opens up, that becomes your teaching. 
and I, and I think until 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 you get that authentication, I think I think you've got to be damn careful. Mm. But it's still, it is unfortunately very very rare. Maybe you know at this point in the development of this whole thing in the West, it's in a still in a fairly fledgling stage, and the kind of things we're alluding to now will become more commonplace once it has gotten better established. We hope so. Yeah. We hope so, and and you know. A lot of mistakes are going to be made. They're, they're already in a lot of mistakes being made, and who knows, there are going to be more mistakes made in the future. But the more I, th I think, you know, I am a traditionalist. I make no bones about that. I'm a Westerner. Um, absolutely. I've got no affiliation or fixation on the East and caught up in all, all of that sort of stuff. I am a Westerner, but, but, but at the same time, I do know the wisdom of the East. I'm prepared to accept the wisdom of the East. And that's good enough for me. Mm -hmm. If it works, don't fix it. Why do you want to tinker with it? Right. Embrace it. Get to know. If you don't understand it, fair enough. And why should you? Stay with it. Look into it. Stay with it until you do understand it. Mm -hmm. Don't go off and start fiddling with it. <laughs> Which is what we. This is what. This is. This is a characteristic of, 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 of Western people. We want to put our stamp on it. Yeah. It, it's like this, and I. That to me is the great danger. And if we keep going down that road. You know, it's, this is just going to end up a whole load of nonsense, hmm. and there aren't going to be the, the Buddhist. The Buddhist path is never going to be fulfilled. It is. It is a very dodgy path. It's not a simple path, and it can be got wrong. There's nothing easy about this. But if you if you follow the guidelines that have been in place for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, put in place. By 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 truly truly awakened beings who see everything clear, isn't that good enough for you? Have the humility. It's the thing that us. Never mind East and West. The thing we, we may not like ourselves, as I say, is a Western characteristic. The other West. The other Western characteristic is we don't do humility. Eastern people do humility. We don't do humility. Oh, I want it my way. The, 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 the willingness to say, look, I don't understand, it, it's, it's a bit too much, but I'll bow my head to it and I'll stay, stay with it and hopefully it will clarify and then, and then I will see. And that is a massive challenge to us Western people. Yeah. We don't, we don't do hum And humility, humility is a part, part of the spiritual path. This, this is not, this is not a, um, an option. Humility has to, you have to have a willingness to, to put your head on the ground, to give yourself up. And if you think that's a lot of nonsense and you can do it without doing that, I don't think you're going to pull it off. And I've never come across anybody that has. I've never heard of anybody that's done it, but do these shortcuts by westernizing it. I don't know, they might be there because I'm not really plugged in, certainly not in America. They might be there, but I've never, I've never heard of it. So why why change something that works? Other 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 than your own conceit, that's why you want to change it. Pride goeth before a fall, they say. Yep, absolutely. And that's that's my, you know, that's that, that's what I, that's what, what really bothers me. It bothers me a lot, yeah. actually, because I love I love. I love this path. I think it's the. I think it's the greatest thing that any human can aspire. I would say that, wouldn't I? But it's the greatest thing that, that anybody can do. I think it's the culmination of human uh, of human development on the on the, on the scale of um, evolution. Yeah. And I and I would just hate to see it, you know, end end up in the dust because of our because of our conceit, and because we we're not prepared to bow our heads. Ultimately, I think, as you were saying, there's some kind of mysterious guidance, you know, that is guiding many, yes. many of us, not only individually, but perhaps masses of us. And uh, hopefully that will prevail and uh, will steer clear of the rocks that civilization seems to be mm. heading toward. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can hope. This is, it's, it's always been a dodgy, it's always been a dodgy thing since yeah. the beginning. Yeah, and, and it always will be. Because, because what we're doing is it's the ultimate thing that humans can do and it's never for that reason it's never going to be easy and it's never going to be for the masses yeah just for those that have reached that point of evolution 
And I would say that hopefully the percentage of people in society who have reached that point in evolution will, will be getting a lot larger, uh, and it seems to be getting a lot larger, and uh, that perhaps a, a, even, if it's, even if it's no kind of majority or anything, a, a more significant percentage will begin to have a societal impact that we mm. so much need and haven't much seen yet. Well, we can, you know, we can we can get it wrong. We can get it wrong in the sense of getting the path wrong, but that doesn't stop us becoming a better human being. Right. It doesn't stop us bringing good qualities to society and changing the values, even though we may not be strictly on the path. You know, it isn't about becoming a bad person. You can still become a wonderful person that can bring great benefit to people in the world. Um, but it would be just so much better if they were, you know, truly on the path that they can then give others as well. So it's not, you know, it's, this isn't black. This isn't black and white. But 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 it would be, you know, it'd be good so that the thing keeps going. There's a lineage that goes and into the future for people. And if we lose that, then it will go downhill. True. It's got to go downhill. Okay. Well, I th I'm afraid I better wrap it up. Um, we've gone. Out, we've had a pretty good, pretty good talk here. I think. Um, is any any final concluding remark you'd like to make, or have we pretty much covered it? I think I think I said what. I, there's a couple of things I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. I mean, which is a lot of people won't agree with, and would be very challenging definitely challenging and it's good you've got to be challenged when you're doing this you can't this isn't about the comfort zone right this is about being challenged and i think i like to think well this is how i see things yeah uh, uh, and uh, and i am a challenging person and i think what i what i've thrown out there so <laughs> you ask the students in my group i think they probably agree with that 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 um you know we we need to be we need, we, we need to, we need to watch it and we need to watch ourselves and we need to be challenged and, and never get into that complacency and think that you've cracked it because yeah. that's a very, very dangerous road to go down. And and I hope, you know, what I said is challenging, whether people will agree with it or not, I don't know, but uh, there you go. Sounded I'm not good out, to me. I, I I'm, not out to, I'm not out to save the world. I, I gave that one up when I was 10 years old or something. <laughs> it's just... Uh, you know, to do my best and to offer offer the way I see things. That's all. Good. Take it. Well, you're one of these people that I would say is living a life well lived. So, congratulations on everything you've done and are doing. I'm sure you don't. You're not going to let that go to your head because you've really been doing it, which breeds humility. Mm -hmm. um, so let me just make a couple of concluding remarks. Um, I've been talking with Aloka David Smith, who lives in the UK, teaches in the UK. Um, you you still in Oxford or you're just born there? Where are you? No, now? no. No, I was born I'm actually I'm actually based in Birmingham, it's the middle of the country. Sure, it's a very, very very convenient place for our group. Yeah. And uh obviously you have weekly meetings there and so on, and then you give retreats around the country and even Ireland, I I think I heard you say. Yeah. Uh yeah. so people if they live over there or on the continent might want to get in touch or come to well, some of those. Hmm? Sure. They 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 come to the Dharma Mind website. Right, they can uh, find out all the details. It's very, it's very comprehensive. Yes, yeah. we're, we're totally open, and everybody's welcome. Yep, as and long as they follow the form. <laughs> and I'll be linking to that. So uh, there'll be a Thank page. You. Yeah, sure. There'll be a page on Buddha at the Gas Pump on thatgap.com about this interview, and it'll have a link to David Oloka's books and to his website where you can find out more. Um, in a general sense, if you you know more, some general concluding remarks on. Batgap.com. You'll find a number of ways of uh, finding the past interviews, different indexes, alphabetical, chronological, topical. There's a, a, a future interviews section where you can see who's uh, who the upcoming guests are, and some other stuff. Just pull down the menus and explore. There's also a, a, a discussion group that crops up around each interview, so there'll be one for this interview, and there is a link to an audio podcast. Um, if you prefer to listen to these in audio rather than sit in front of your computer, there's a donate button, which I appreciate people clicking. There is a link to be notified of each, of each new interview as it's released by email. You just uh, subscribe to the email notification and get one about one a week. So that's about it. Um, next week is another Buddhist teacher, Shin, Shinzen Young, and um, we'll talk about him when we get to him. But uh, thank you very much, David. I appreciate you taking the time. 
I, I think oh, okay. I mean, I slipped into David. Your, <laughs> that's all right. Our locus is, is my preferred name, but yeah. it, it, I, I've got no great hang up on it. So, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I've enjoyed it very much, and I've enjoyed being given the freedom to express myself. I mean, I, I am a talker. I mean, I could go on forever, but you give me space to say what I consider to be important. Good. important things and if people want to um, hear you say even more you have got you've written four books and there's like a your podcast five, five, five books, books and I, i've been listening to some of your podcasts there are a great many of those so there's there's plenty days. to uh, plenty to dip oh, yeah. into if one wants to sure, yeah sure, sure. okay well thank you very great. much thanks very much rick yeah all See the best later. thank you